Good evening. This is Chairwoman Julie Hen. I now call to order the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for Tuesday, November 22nd, 2022. I invite you to recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag to be led by Ms. Roa Hassan. We will then have a moment of silence in recognition of those who have served education in Baltimore County. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Tonight's Board of Education meeting is being held in person and virtually and broadcast online through Microsoft Teams and through BCPS TV, Comcast Xfinity Channel 73, Verizon Fios Channel 34. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this evening will be done by roll call vote. The first item on the agenda is the consideration of the November 22nd agenda. Dr. Williams, are there any additions or changes to tonight's agenda? There are no additions or changes. Okay. Hearing none, the agenda stands as presented. Earlier this evening, the board met in closed session pursuant to the Open Meetings Act for the following reasons. To one, discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom it has jurisdiction, or any other personnel matter that affects one or more specific individuals. Seven, consult with counsel to obtain legal advice. And nine, conduct con collective bargaining negotiations or consider matters that relate to the negotiations. The minutes of the closed session and information summary can be found on board docs under this board meeting agenda date. Every year the Board of Education publishes the annual comprehensive financial report and each year student artwork is included in the publication. Later this evening, the ACFR will be presented to the board and we would like to recognize those students whose artwork is included. Each participating student receives a gift card. The following students artwork was selected. Leah Abramoff, grade eight, Sudbrook Magnet Middle School. Caden Brown, grade eight, Deer Park Middle Magnet School. Nadia Kofer, grade eight, Lock Raven Technical Academy. Madeline Hoyle, grade seven, Middle River Magnet, I'm sorry, Middle River Middle School. Scarlett Alvarado, Puerto, grade seven, Deep Creek Middle School. Sylvia Schmidt, grade six, Lock Raven Technical Academy. And Erica Tolson, grade seven, Windsor Mill Middle School. Let's give those students a round of applause. Congratulations. The next item is a special order of business, recognition of our outgoing board members. I have the distinct honor and privilege of recognizing the tremendous efforts of the members of the Board of Education whose terms have now come to an end. It is a bittersweet moment as we say goodbye to most of this current board and prepare to welcome newly elected board members, as well as those that will be appointed by the governor-elect in January. It takes the collective efforts of a committed team to effect change. I am so grateful for these incredible board members, for their unwavering commitment and tireless efforts on behalf of children. During this unprecedented time in public education, 
our board members have approached every decision with students in mind and always asked how an action will help raise the bar, close gaps, and prepare every student for the future. Their steadfast advocacy is beyond measure, and I can't begin to adequately thank them for their service and for the personal sacrifice they have made advocating for the students and staff of Baltimore County Public Schools. The challenges of the last two and a half years have made this work increasingly difficult, but these board members continue to show up and give generously of their time and talents. We faced many obstacles as a team, but I am so very proud of all that was accomplished working together. This includes improved transparency and open discourse, prioritization of school system resources, improved community and stakeholder engagement, strong governance and fiscal oversight, and much more. Thank you, board members. We wish you the very best in your future pursuits and know that you will continue to advocate on behalf of our students wherever you go. So I ask if you could join me when I call your names in the front of the dais. Dr. Williams, will you join us as well? First, I'd like to recognize Dr. Aaron Hager. Participating virtually, we'd like to recognize Ms. Molly Joes. <laughs> Ms. Kathleen Causey. And also not with us um, is Ms. Lisa Mack, former board member. Let's give Ms. Mack a big round of applause. <laughs> also participating remotely, Mr. John Offerman. Thank you, Mr. Offerman, for your service. Ms. Cheryl Pasteur, Delegate-elect Cheryl Pasteur, is with us. <laughs> Welcome back. Ms. Lily Rowe. <laughs> Ms. Makita Scott. Ms. Felicia Stileski.
Mr. Russ Kuhn. Thank you all. And I had a chance to speak with the governor's office, and he wanted me to share a special message with all of you this evening on your occasion. Governor Hogan wants to deeply thank all of you for your service on this board. He appreciates your time, your effort, and he recognizes that this is a job that is um, very tough, but is always worth the effort when it comes to our children's education. So he asked me to express his appreciation for your service, to thank you for a job well done. And you have the deepest appreciation of both him and his office. So that's from the governor himself. Next, before I introduce um, the elected officials who are with us, I also have special messages from some electeds who could not be here with us, beginning with Delegate Ben Brooks, who has some special greetings for two of our members. Beginning with Delegate-Elect Pasture. If you would come forward. Ms. Delegate Pasture, that has such a great ring to it. <laughs> So on behalf of Delegate Brooks, um, be it hereby known to all that sincerest congratulations are offered to Cheryl Pasture in recognition of her commitment, consistency, and dedication to excellence in education. She has served the students of Baltimore County with fervor as a teacher, principal, and school board member, presented on this 22nd day of November 2022 by Delegate Benjamin Brooks of Baltimore County Legislative District 10. And Ms. Makita Scott, Delegate Brooks also. Be it hereby known to all that sincerest congratulations are offered to Ms. Makita Scott in recognition of her leadership serving as chair of the Baltimore County School Board, her dedication to the board, and the pursuit of excellence in education is laudable. Presented on this 22nd day of November 2022 by Delegate Benjamin Brooks of Baltimore County Legislative District 10. Congratulations. Congratulations. Next, I have a message from former Senator Jim Broshan for Ms. Kathleen Causey and Ms. Lily Rowe. If you could, two could come forward. Lily and Kathleen, it only seems like yesterday when a coalition led by Kathy Forbes who's with us, and Yara Sheikh lobbied me heavily to reintroduce legislation for an elected school board that had continuously failed over the years. Only a year earlier, Senator Zirkin's bill failed in a four to three vote in delegation, and I was told point blank not to even bother putting the legislation in because they would do everything in their power to kill it. But lo and behold, everyone from Randallstown to Essex got on board and the education activists who cared about accountability for their children helped us cross the finish line. The beauty of this legislation is that I really think it was carved out for the two of you. <sighs> Lily, you have been a fierce advocate for doing what you have thought was right, and in the process, learning how to form coalitions to get things done. You have a lot to be proud of. Kathleen, you have been a tremendous voice for North County, and while everyone across the county may not have always agreed with you, North County certainly has. The independence and thoughtfulness you've exerted on this board and the leadership you've provided have really changed the way in which a board should be acting against a check, as a check. You will both be missed, but thank you from the bottom of my heart is for setting the standard for what true accountability should look like. Your former senator and friend, Senator Jim Broshan. And 
with that, I'd like to introduce our elected officials who are with us this evening, beginning with Mr. County Executive. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, good evening to all. It is my pleasure to join in the accolades for our outstanding uh, board members who have given so much to the residents of Baltimore County, the students and uh, educators across this great jurisdiction. We are blessed and thankful for your service. Uh, I have uh, citations as well to just give our thanks for your service, uh, groundbreaking service in many regards for our first uh, elected and hybrid board. And uh, again, just want to thank you all for the ways in which you have prioritized our educators and our students day in and day out. Uh, Baltimore County is better because of each of you. Uh, I am grateful for your service and am honored for the opportunity to have served alongside each of you. So I'm going to let Pete Chris Kumis uh, on my team uh, read out some of our citations. Uh, they are similarly uh, situated for all of our outgoing members, but it just Please accept my profound uh, gratitude and appreciation for your service. And uh, we're looking forward to big things ahead for all of you. Um, and uh, just thank you again for the excellence that you have set forward that we're going to proceed together on in the years ahead. So I'm really grateful for your service. And thank you all. Congratulations for your service. Pete, you want to give us our uh, citations? Lisa's not here, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just recognize and read this one because it's my home district. So, In recognition and gratitude for the service and dedication to the Baltimore County School Board, you have far exceeded the expectations set before you and your dedication, diligence, and thoughtful contributions will be greatly missed. On behalf of all of its residents, Baltimore County thanks you for your commitment to the Baltimore County School Board, given under the county executive's hand on this day, 2022. So Lisa Mack is not here. Cheryl is though. Cheryl is. Give me one minute. Thank you all again for your service. We're grateful. Next, I'd like to welcome Delegate Kathy Forbes. Thank you all for your service. When the elected school board bill, the hybrid bill was passed, and Baltimore County for the first time was gonna be able to elect their school board, we were hoping for candidates like you to step forward who really cared, who came from your community and cared about our schools and put our students first and our teachers first. And you didn't know what you were getting into. We didn't know what was coming in 2020 and you've endured both the pandemic, which wasn't easy in any, any seat representing people, um, but particularly in our schools. And you didn't, we didn't know about the ransomware attack, but you weathered it all and you made the best decisions with the information you were given and you always put students first. So I'm so grateful for your service and I thank you all and I wish you all well. Thank you. Next, I'd like to welcome Delegate Dana Stein. Good evening, thank you. Thank you and good evening. Uh, I want to echo the thanks of County Executive and Delegate Kathy Forbes for, for your service to all the outgoing members of the school board. 
uh, we know how time consuming and how much of a commitment it means to be a member of the school board. And uh, so we appreciate your commitment to our students. And uh, I remember working with on uh, in the House of Delegates with Delegate Steve Lafferty back in 2014 on the legislation establishing the hybrid school board. So we are very pleased that you have been among the first uh, school board members to be elected under under that uh, legislation. And I would be remiss if I didn't give a special shout out to my former school board member uh, and now delegate elect, Cheryl Pasture. As you know, I mean, Cheryl brings an unmatched passion for quality of educational outcomes for all students. And over the years that I've known Cheryl, I've learned so much about, uh, about education and the needs of, of young, young people. And uh, uh, one of her many legacies will be the CTE Center in Northwest Baltimore County. But uh, again, it's just one of many legacies, and I look forward to working with her. She brings her voice and her passion to Annapolis. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. And is there anyone I missed? Uh, no? OK. Thank you all very much. Thank you, board members, and congratulations again. Yes, Dr. Williams. Yes. And don't go too far, because we have, we have an time for comments from each of you, so OK. so much for having me and I uh, just wanted to stop by and from the bottom of my heart and on behalf of the 850,000 citizens of Baltimore County I want to again thank you so very very much for your service to Baltimore County particularly by making sure our children are educated mm -hmm. to the best of our ability so uh, I know it's not easy I know it's tough I know that uh, it's a very, very important job, and unfortunately, we could never pay you as much time you put into it, and all the heartache and pain and disagreements and agreements, and I know that it's tough, but somebody had to do it, and by stepping up, you made our county better, and you helped our children, and, uh, you know, I, I guess want to thank you from the bottom of my heart and on behalf of all the city. Thank you so much.
I now invite our honored board members to share their personal comments, um, beginning with Delegate Elect Ms. Pester. You'd like to. Would you? Sure. Wherever you like. It's, it's your day. Good evening. For 27 years of my decades in education, I have loved Baltimore County Public Schools. This is a season of thanksgiving and gratefulness, a time to reflect, a time to heal, a time to demonstrate faith. It is my hope that the next board will come to the table for our children, all of them, to speak truths with integrity and respect. I hope this board and the next, along with the decision makers in the system, will see our children through a human lens before a fiscal one, thinking about what it takes to offer a quality education a strong curriculum, food security, a safe environment, equity for all groups regardless of gender, gender preferences, ethnicity, religion, race, economic condition. I hope that the staff members who make these ha things happen for our children <laughs> are never forgotten or taken for granted. I hope that this board to the very end and the next board from its beginning care more about children and those who work with them every day than personal power or voice or personal agendas. I hope that more organizations like Strong Schools Maryland Bridge, Maryland, the Highlanders, the Baltimore County Con Continentals, Pikesville Schools Coalition, NAACP, step up to support our schools. I will remain hopeful, as it is said in Romans 12:12, 12, 12, even when afflicted, our children deserve that. They are our hope and our blessing. I love Baltimore County Public Schools and I will always serve in some capacity the children and those who also love it. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Pasture. Ms. Pasture. This has been an exceptional um, time in my life to spend serving the students of Baltimore County and not an easy time. And I think that we're still recovering from a lot of things that have happened. And as we rebuild and continue to improve the things that we're doing, I have confidence in the people who are coming on after us to be able to continue to represent those students and to continue the work and to continue improving our facilities. We've managed to have all of our schools air conditioned and that was something that uh, I don't know if we could have had without the community support and an elected board. And I appreciate that when we're dealing with life safety issues in buildings, it's important to solve those. And we have very good staff who do that. And I also um, 
think that we should continue to work with organizations like Student Support Network to help to provide uh, resources to children who lack resources. And that, that this is one of a very important thing that I hope that the next board will continue to do. But the thing that we really need to focus on more than anything else is our academic achievement in literacy. We cannot have a functional democracy if we do not have a functionally literate population. And that is something that I think we see all around us when we see people who read newspaper articles and come to very different conclusions by them and become manipulated by conspiracy theorists and all kinds of things that confuse people because their reading and their education was not adequate to combat their own confusion. And I think that now more than ever, it is important that we remember that the most important thing is that the student can read. And we teach many other things besides that, but a student who can read can teach themselves a lot of things. And I think that needs to be the focus and I hope that the next board will um, continue that. And so thank you everyone, thank you to all of our staff, it's been my pleasure to serve. Thank you, Ms. Rowe. Mrs. Causey? Good evening uh, to everyone. Um, it is uh, a wonderful evening. Um, I have many emotions and thoughts as uh, this is my last board meeting. I have served for seven and a half years, um, and my mission has always been focused on improving students' academic opportunities and success. I will try to keep my remarks brief. Ms. Hen. <laughs> uh, for folks that want to hear more, um, I will be uh, planning a new digital presence where we can stay connected and where I hope to share more reflections, uh, appreciations for this journey, and as well as my future endeavors. Since uh, my passion for children achieving their potential, my passion for public education is not going to end tonight. Um, we were told we could have one guest, so I chose my father. So, Dad, if you could stand and be recognized. So, uh, my father uh, represents my past, my present, and my future. My past that shaped and formed me to appreciate service to appreciate the amazing public education that I received. He's also my present in that he has been my rock during so many challenges of life and has also been a uh, cheerleader and a supporter and someone to uh, laugh and appreciate uh, my joys and to celebrate uh, accomplishments. He also represents uh, my future because I hope to spend significant time with my dad, my husband, our children, and now we have two son-in-laws, extended family, my faith family, and friends, and colleagues. Um, I could not have made it through this roller coaster ride of service to increase the effective governance of this Board of Education without all of you. So you have my deepest thanks and appreciation, and thank you to all who have encouraged me or given me critical feedback, uh, who have uh, given me information, I really have appreciated all of it, um, and it has helped me. I just want to touch briefly on uh, three women who um, really have inspired me and um, been a foundation. My uh, grandmother, my dad's mom, was a teacher in the early 1900s. She was born with vision impairment called legally blind back then, uh, but she was assisted to see with uh, Coke bottle eyeglasses. Uh, she became a teacher and she taught in a one room schoolhouse in the early 1900s in rural area of upstate New York. Before Airbnb, she was able to rent a room with a family in the small village since she lived in a city and had no transportation. And this is a book that my dad gave me. 
the one room schoolhouse, uh, which if you can find it in print, it's really very interesting about the history of education in America, which has had um, accomplishments, but also stains and struggles and the work continues. Um, my mother also um, grew up in a rural area with 4-H, farming, gardening. She did well in school, but there were barriers to her going on to college. Uh, so she went to secretary school. And then when she was uh, growing up our family and being a stay-at-home mom, um, and we know none of those moms ever actually stay home because they're busy volunteering in school, church, uh, carting kids around, including other people's children. Uh, she also was engaged in environmental issues, clean water, clean air, nutritious food. Uh, and I seem to recall her work with the uh, Federal Clean Water Act. Um, she was a researcher. She used secretarial skills for projects and meetings. And it was an epiphany one time when I was working with many to address clean water and healthy air for our students, teachers and staff and school communities, and was talking with advocates from the League of Women Voters about Delaney's infamous brown water. And we were all continuing to advocate. And I realized that I was doing similar work to my mom. 40 years earlier. And the impacts that we can make today are based on the impacts that have others have made before us. So that was very uh, significant and touching. And in this time of Thanksgiving, I think we all really need to reflect on all of those that have come before us that have worked to improve life, life for others, communities, government structures. And then lastly, uh, I want to thank my friend, my BFF, she knows who she is, a retired reading specialist. She taught in Seattle and Tacoma, Washington for many years and then several years in the eastern shore of Maryland. Intelligent, passionate about helping struggling readers. She only wanted the struggling readers. She said, I can help them. Those are the ones I need to have. Those are the students I want that I can help. And she was just hardworking like so many of our uh, dedicated teachers and educational support pro professionals. So with that, I am just immensely grateful for the opportunity that I've had, and I uh, appreciate Dr. Williams and my colleagues on the board, student members of the board, um, and all of our staff. Uh, I've learned from you, I've grown, and I just, I'm just really very humbled and grateful. So thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Stolowski? Good evening. Good evening. Sorry. Um, it was an absolute honor um, to have the privilege to serve on the board. And, um, you know, um, I want to thank all the stakeholders that um, placed their faith in me and, um, you know, allowed me to, you know, what I hope is play a role in my short service in helping to improve the school system. As both a teacher and during my time on the board, my passion has always been the well-being of, of children, socially, emotionally, academically. And I certainly pledge to continue that path for all my years in the future. And um, I just want to thank everybody, uh, my fellow board members, staff members, for all the collaboration that we did together, um, great discussions about various issues that hopefully help to bring improvements to the school system. And I also really admire how we focused on all of the wonderful things that are happening in Baltimore County as well. Um, I wish everybody a peaceful Thanksgiving. I hope you take the time to count your blessings. And um, I do want to uh, echo what you said, Ms. Cossey, about you know, recognizing the past and how important the past is and the legacy of those that came before us to really lay a value system that we all uh, can learn from. I wish you all many blessings and thank you for putting your faith in me. Thank you. Ms. Joes? Thank you. Um, I, I want to express my thanks to the very wonderful BCPS staff that have been critical uh, to everything from keeping our schools safe, welcoming, and providing excellent education while continuing to improve. Um, thanks to Dr. Williams and the entire cabinet. I want to thank Ms. Gover for everything she does to keep the board functioning. 
Mr. Art McDaniel, who I enormously enjoy talking to and who's always made sure I had a hot cup of tea for those marathon meetings. Um, at the core of every decision we make, it has an impact on all of our children. And that has been my guiding principle. I will continue to learn, advocate for change, and we get clarity when we listen to the silence of our children and when we hear the quiet voices over the noise of the loudest. So thank you all and happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Thank you, Mrs. Hahn. Thank you. So um, as all of you know, I'm, I'm here until July, but I do want to take the time and thank each and every one of you. You have made these past few months a very educational experience for me. Um, but you've also shown what it means to lead. You've shown what it means to lead by example, what it means to grow as human beings, to be fierce and passionate and strong and to never, ever stop learning. So this is a bittersweet moment for me because I feel as though I've just met all of you and here I am saying goodbye. But you each have shown what it means to be leaders. You each will continue to shatter even more glass ceilings. You will continue to get into good trouble because I will keep saying that and you will keep hearing it. But I'm so grateful to be on this dais with each and every one of you. So thank you for teaching me what it means to be a swab. Thank you for teaching me what it means to love students unconditionally. I see your appreciation for our students. As a student, I am so, so beyond grateful for you. I'm hopeful that the next board can fill half of your shoes. So thank you guys so much. Thank you. Ms. Scott? Yes, hi. Thank you for that. Um, I would, I think, like to say that I am, it, it's been quite an interesting journey. I've learned a lot, uh, and I have I feel like we have accomplished, and we've done a lot of things, most notably um, starting the equity committee. Uh, prior to COVID, equity looked one way. After COVID, I think it showed um, a lot of the areas that we can improve upon and um, the inequities in our system. And I feel very proud to have worked with the comparable staff in the um, equity office who has um, answered every every question and um, Dr. Williams who has uh, taken the lead on this and also the um, equity council which is made up of community members who've added their input all of which I believe is a holistic approach to making a uh, stronger system and ultimately helping to improve outcomes for our students. I came to the board and that was one of the main things that I wanted to work on. I started out first with the basketball hoops. You may remember I talked about that, um, making sure that they were up at schools, um, at all of the schools throughout um, uh, the county, which, as I understand, um, I believe they are. So I think that was something important. And it's a way that we show our commitment to working in and with the community and um, improving outcomes for our children. So I've just enjoyed working with my colleagues, and um, I think that it's going to be interesting um, when the new board comes on, the direction that they will go in. But I think that they will have the space and the guidance of the uh, or the partnership, rather, with the staff, which will be immeasurable. Because we have, as Ms. Jones was saying, we have some wonderful staff who are very knowledgeable in what they do. And I am grateful for um, all of the guidance and assistance that, that you all have provided. So thank you. Thank you. Dr. Hager? Um, so I did not prepare remarks because as an appointed um, me member, I will be holding over until our new members are um, appointed after our new governor is sworn in. So um, that means that some of us will be staying on. Um, but I would like to say, again, having not prepared anything, what a joy it's been to serve with so many uh, wonderful, dedicated 
uh, servants for the school system, and I've gotten to know folks that um, I, I, I didn't know anyone on the board before I joined, and many of them I didn't get to see in person for almost a year. And so finally, um, I feel like we've we've built a great uh, working relationship and um, and a friendship for in many cases as well. So. Um, I know I will miss you, and I think that the school system uh, will miss you all as well. And thank you so much for everything you've done. I've gotten to serve with four different SMOVs, all of whom have been fantastic. Um, and I'm really looking forward to the new school board. I have um, said to my colleagues tonight that I, you know, my, my plan is to kind of take a take a back seat, and hopefully they'll find their way and, and maybe be a resource if, if possible, because this was a little unanticipated. Um, but uh, but we will. Uh, I'll be around, um, but again, kind of on the sideline to to hopefully um, be a resource if needed. So, hope maybe I'll have some remarks remarks in March prepared. So, when that, when that time finally comes around, but thank you all so much for everything you've done for the school system. Thank you, Mr. Kuhn. Okay, we have a long agenda tonight, so I'm going to keep this brief since I didn't prepare anything, since I, too, am appointed, and this will not be my last meeting. Um, I do want to say Happy Thanksgiving to everyone. Um, I hope you take time to enjoy this time with your family. Um, uh, I would like to thank all my fellow board members for all the time, regardless of whether we agreed. Um, you know, we we all have opinions and, and deep um, deep beliefs, and we all were here to to help the students and the children achieve. Um, and this entire enterprise, which is very, very large, you know, we all support the academic advancement and educational achievement. And I hope that this this body, this governing body, can help move the bar um, for for the students. Uh, so, so thank you all, and I want to thank my family for all their support and love during this time. It's been four years. It feels longer than that. Uh, and it actually is longer than that now since they've extended uh, uh, the appointees. Um, so you're stuck with me for a few more meetings. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Um, the next item, regular item on the agenda, is personnel matters, and for that I call on Ms. Anderson. Good evening, Chairwoman Hen, Vice Chair McMillian, Superintendent Williams, and members of the board. I would like the board's consent for the following personnel matters, terminations, retirements, resignations, deceased recognition of service, and certificated appointments. Do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters as presented in Exhibit F1? So move Stileski. Do I have a second? Second row. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Brown? Yes. Ms. Yes. Ms. Yes. 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 Mr. Yes. Dr. Yes. 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 The motion carries. Do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters as presented in exhibits F2 through F5? So move Stileski. Do I have a second? Second. Hassan. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Stileski? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is administrative appointments, and for that I call on Dr. Williams. Thank you, Madam Chair Hen, Vice Chair McMillian, and members of the board. I am bringing forward the following administrative appointments. For your approval, Specialist Compliance, Office of Compliance, Specialist Preschool Services, Department of Special Education, two positions, Manager Operations, Office of Transportation, and Supervisor, School Social Work Services, Office of Student Support Services. Thank you. Do I have a motion to approve the administrative appointments as presented in Exhibit G1? So moved, Hassan. Do I have a second? Second, Kuhn. 
Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Stileski? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. The motion carries. Dr. Williams? Thank you. Our first appointment is Jessica M. Oches Oshikovich. Let me try that again. Jessica Oshipovich as the specialist in compliance in the Office of Compliance. Please stand. Joining her. <laughs> joining her is her son, Eli. Welcome, Eli. Jessica brings over 19 years of service in Baltimore County Public Schools. Previously, she served as an IEP facilitator in the Department of Special Education. She's also served as a teacher of special ed inclusion at Honeygo Elementary School, a stat teacher at Honeygo Elementary School, a teacher resource in the Office of Mathematics, a stat teacher at Vincent Farm Elementary, and classroom teacher at both Vincent Farm Elementary and Ryderwood Elementary. Congratulations. Next appointment, we have Janet R. Teeter, Manager, Operations Office, there she is, of Transportation. Joining her is her husband, Gary Teeter, thank you. Uh, she brings over 41 years of service in Baltimore County Public Schools. We can acknowledge just that right there. Currently, she serves as the uh, Senior Operations Supervisor in the Office of Transportation. Prior to that, she was a Transportation Assistant. She was uh, in the Office of Transportation, Transportation Assistant of Special Ed, a Routing Assistant, and a School Bus Driver in the Office of Transportation. Congratulations, Ms. Teeter. Next, we have Nathan K. Yamada as the supervisor of school social work services in the Office of Student Support Services. Joining him is his wife, Ashley Yamada. Please stand. He brings over six years of experience in Baltimore County. Pr uh, prior to this appointment, he served as a social worker in the Office of Student Support Services. He was a social worker at Perry Hall High School. And previous experience, he worked at Shepherd Pratt health system and Paul Ilani day treatment program for over one year. Congratulations, Mr. Nathan K. Yamada. <laughs> Next, we have Erica A. Uh, Saladay uh, as the specialist of preschool services in the Department of Special Education. She's not attending to this evening. She brings over 16 years of experience in Baltimore County. Previously, she served as a resource teacher in the Department of Special Education. Prior to that, she was a special ed teacher of early child self-contained at Kearney Elementary. She had prior experience at Shepherd Pratt Health System and Kennedy Krieger Institute. Congratulations, Erica A. Saladay. Next, we have Catherine N. Walton. She is not attending. Um, this appointment is for the specialist of preschool services in the Department of Special Education. She brings six years of experience in Baltimore County. Previously, she served as a resource teacher in the Department of Special Ed. She also served as uh, prior experience at, at Kennedy Krieger Institute for over 15 years. Congratulations, Catherine N. Walton. so much. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Let's give everybody one more round of applause. Congratulations. Our next item is public comment. This is one of the opportunities the board provides to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens. As appropriate, we will refer your concerns to the superintendent for follow-up by his staff. The Board of Education will conduct the public comment portion of the meeting by allowing those who registered to speak to attend in person. Registration was open to the public one week prior to tonight's board meeting and was closed at 3 p.m. yesterday for anyone wishing to speak at this evening's meeting. 
Board practice limits to 10 the number of speakers at a regularly scheduled board meeting. Speakers are selected randomly using an electronic selection process from all registrations received within the designated time frame. Each speaker is allowed three minutes to address the board. Of course, if fewer than 10 registrations are received, all who registered will be permitted to speak. However, no speaker substitutions will be allowed. While we encourage public input on policy, programs, and practices within the purview of this board and this school system, this is not the proper forum to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. We encourage everyone to utilize existing dispute resolution processes as appropriate. I remind everyone that inappropriate personal remarks or other behavior that disrupts or interferes with the conduct of this meeting are out of order. Persons using language that is threatening or promotes violence against a BCPS employee are subject to legal penalties. Persons who otherwise disrupt or disturb this meeting will not be allowed to continue their remarks and will be escorted from the meeting. I ask speakers to observe the three-minute clock, which will let you know when your time is up. Please conclude your remarks when you hear the tone or see that time has expired. The microphone will be turned off at the end of your time, and it could be turned off if a speaker addresses specific student or employee matters or is commenting on matters not related to public education in Baltimore County. If not selected, the public may submit their comments to the board members via email at boe at bcps.org. More information is provided on the board's website at bcps.org under Board of Education Participation by the Public. I now call on our advisory and stakeholder group leaders to speak. Our first speaker is Leslie Weber with the PTA Council. Good evening and welcome. Good evening, Chairperson Hen, Vice Chair McMillian, Board of Ed members, and Dr. Williams. I haven't been able to make, make, make a meeting for a while, so I'd like to update everyone on what PTA Council has been up to. We've been very busy restarting PTA units at three high schools, Lansdowne, Randallstown, and Woodlawn, four middle schools, Deep Creek, Lansdowne, Northwest Academy, and Pikesville, and a number of elementary schools, including Cedarmere, Church Lane, Featherbed Lane, Hebville, Johnny Cake, Millbrook, Norwood, Scotts Branch, Seneca, Wellwood, Winan, and, Wood, and Woodholm. Huge thanks to our VP for Leadership, Jane Lee, and Extension Committee Chair, Emory Young, for handling so much of this work. We've also been busy training local leaders, first at our September fall workshops at Lock Raven High School and at our November virtual training for presidents and treasurers. Both sessions were very well received. I'd like to share a story from our virtual training. The president of one of the units we're helping to restart asked about how to engage parents at her school to run for board positions. She has great parent participation, but is having trouble getting parents to take the next step to, to, take the next step to serve as PTA leaders. A number of unit leaders asked, for, asked her to post her contact information in the chat so they could help her in some way. This is the power of PTA, a strong and supportive county, state, and national network serving to better the lives of children. Back to what PTA Council has been doing lately. In October, we partnered with the Area Education Advisory Councils to host a virtual Board of Education forum. Thanks to PTA Council Advocacy and Legislation Committee Chair Beth Jarrett and AEAC Coordinator Donna Sibley for planning this informative event. In October and November, PTA Council and PTA Presidents took part in virtual roundtables with Deputy Superintendent Dr. Yarbrough and Chief of Staff Ms. Charlie Green to discuss a wide range of education issues. We're grateful to Dr. Williams for attending in October and to Sue Han from the BCPS Office of Family and Community Engagement who sits on our board for facilitating. We look forward to these monthly events. Our board is changing. We'll greatly miss Christina Pumphrey, our central area vice president, who, who will soon join you representing District 6. Thanks to Christina for many years of service as a PTA unit leader and as a council board member. We'll also miss our longtime TABCO representative, Marcy Cook, who always shared her valuable educator's perspective on our, at our board meetings. We welcome TABCO Vice President Kelly Olds as our new TABCO liaison. We've also recently welcomed new committee, new committee members to our Family, School, and Community Partnerships Committee and our Extension Committee. These committees help us better serve the unit's PTA Council supports. There's more, but that's enough of a recap. Thank you and happy holidays. Thank you. Our next stakeholder group speaker is Donna Sibley with the Area Education Advisory Councils.
Good evening and welcome. Good evening, uh, Chair Hen, uh, Vice Chair Million, Dr. Williams, and members of the board. Um, I am Donna Sibley. I am the coordinator of the five area education advisory councils that are for Baltimore County BCPS. Um, I want to thank all of so many of you that have been so faithful to come to the quarterly or the monthly meetings that um, all of our councils have had and the two yearly meetings that we have with all of the council members and all of the board. Um, it is really, uh, has been really very nice and it has been, the members have really appreciated your attendance and all your advice to us and all your help and we thank you very much. Um, for those of you that are leaving or retiring, I want to wish you the best of luck. And so many of you I've had the pleasure to work with, and I do thank you so much. And whatever you choose to do in your next chapter of your life, I wish you luck. Thank you. Uh, as the board policy 1230 does indicate and does say, the advisory council are to be advisors to the board representing the stakeholders in the five areas of Baltimore County. Uh, in order to be able to know the communities within each of those areas and to be able to adequately uh, actually represent those stakeholders, I and the chairs of all the councils are very active in these communities, in the schools, in the churches, and in the community associations. We also serve on many of the BCPS uh, committees representing those stakeholders in each of our areas. Committees like My IPASS, BCPS, Reopening Committee, Calendar Committee, Equity Advisory Council, Community School Steering Committee, the BCPS Blueprint for Maryland's Future, just to name a few. We would love to always be here and we do appreciate the time we get. However, as I'm sure you will understand, we are all volunteers. We have families. Many of us have also have full-time jobs, some part-time jobs, and our mothers and parents running children. So we always, I'm sure you will understand, we always don't have the extra time to give. But whenever something is critical, we will be here. And I just wanna say, if you haven't made plans for your next chapter, each of you live in one of these five areas and the councils have space for you and we would love to have you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Our next stakeholder speaker is Cindy Sexton with Tabco. Good evening. Good evening, Chair Han, Vice Chair McMillian, Dr. Williams, and members of the board. I want to thank the board members who are ending their terms. The transition to a hybrid board was not without its challenges, whether an elected or appointed member, and the process to become either was not quick, easy for any of those, and each of you put in the time and the effort, and I thank you. We know that the Board of Ed is a nonpartisan position and also that each of us has strong feelings and opinions about how things should be. Thank you for all the times you sought out input from TABCO or listened to me when you didn't seek out the input and other members with concerns and ideas as well. I wish you all the best in your future endeavors. As we transition to the new board with some members starting in December and others not till after the governor's sworn in, we have much work to do. As you know, my goal is recruiting and retaining ed educators and there is much to be done around this. And while compensation is one part, we must address workload issues and what the educator shortage is doing to our staff. Coverages, extra paperwork, students without appropriate supports, large class sizes, the list goes on. <clears throat> I appreciate the work that is being done to acknowledge and address discipline concerns too, but we have much more to do there as well. 
I hear from my counterparts in other counties the same types of concerns, and we've asked our state union to work to make discipline, workload, and special ed some of the top priorities for them, both to assist us at our local level, but also to take it to the state superintendent and to legislators for our upcoming legislative session. Finally, I appreciate the item in the news hub about the deputy superintendent's cross-divisional project to address employee and retiree concerns related to benefits and leaves. These issues fill my inbox, and I know they do for HR staff and many others as well. We need to get this handled and resolved. The HR office is working tirelessly to address and correct these issues, and we appreciate all they're doing. Evenings, weekends, holidays, middle of the night, we get information from them all the time and I know that they're working. But the level of frustration is growing and it will take us acting quickly and efficiently to resolve the issues for the good of the system. And finally, to everyone who is celebrating, I wish you a happy Thanksgiving and again to our board members who were at their last meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Next is general public comment, and our first speaker is Russell Hopewell. Russell Hopewell? Okay. Our next speaker is Vernon Fisher. Good evening. First, let me uh, pay homage to the board members outgoing, and uh, I know that you will continue doing your jobs because uh, I see the passion that you have for being educators and seeing that education is done here. My name is Vernon Fisher. I'm with Cap Alpha Psi Fraternity Incorporated. I am chairman of the chapter at Towson Catonsville, and my job as the chairman of God Right, the 100-year-old mentoring program that we have is to serve the community. So I want to give a recap to what we've been doing here at Baltimore County Public Schools, specifically at Dumbarton. Uh, we've had sessions, what I call sessions, and uh, last year the first session was on purpose, and we were able to get the kids to define purpose and to get them to tell us who they know that has purpose, how do you think they arrived at having purpose, and what is their purpose, and can a person's purpose change? The reactions from the kids, they fully understood the importance of having purpose and had that glare in their eye that you could see they were wondering what they're here for. So our next steps will be to complete a vision board which will be visible to them daily and illustrate their current and future visions. In our last session, um, there was an episode with some of the uh, female classmates. So we uh, took the time out to do an etiquette session and we talked about how to treat female classmates. Um, the reactions were one of, we, got, we have to do better, but the females as well must do better and be accountable. So our next steps with that is to rehash proper etiquette, classroom etiquette, dining etiquette, family dynamics, and business etiquette. Lastly, we had a session on budget. Um, I, I, I had this white hair, and I don't know about you, but uh, I don't recall learning much about budgeting in school. So I thought it would be a good idea to talk about budget, the importance of a budget, the components, the examples of budget, everyday budget and emergency, having emergency money put to the side. And the reactions were, we came up with, um, we talked about minimum wage, real employment, employment income, expenses, food and travel and savings, and next steps, wants versus needs, savings versus investing, spending discipline, discuss jobs based on education. So our plan is to connect with every student we encounter to help them understand the concept and implement such concept of being the best you you can be. Thank you. 
Our next speaker is Bosch Ferrone. Good evening to all. Today is a day of celebration. Truly kudos to all of you on the board, whether you are leaving or staying on. Julie Hen, in my view, has outperformed herself. Dedicated, focused, communicative, respectful to the system and to the public and stern when it comes, there is a need for that. Julie focused on right budget for all students and focused on school safety. I want you to know, as an observant of the board for 25 plus years, that the success of a board meeting is in the preparation before. And I really noticed the difference, a positive difference when you are on the helm, Miss Julie Hen. Kathleen Causey and Lily Rome will always have a very special corner in my educational heart. Kathleen has been always prepared. I've seen a lot of board members. Kathleen is always prepared, always had an extensive research. Kathleen always focused on the facts and what is best for all students. Kathleen worked hard for all of us regardless of whom we are. I believe you, Kathleen, can be in a higher place and I really wish you do. Lily Rowe is so special to me early on. She was like me, an advocate, a speaker, and she took care of her community in Helendale, Lock Raven, and beyond that. She advocated for all students. You remember the air conditioners and so forth. And I want to remember one moment that was really important for me with Lily Rowe. She was one time frustrated with the boards just really rubber stamping the budget and we had no air conditioners. And I'm really paraphrasing. So she stood up in public session, speaking, had a little bit kind of sliver of temper. You people, why don't you ask for what the school system needs? And I was really impressed with that. It gave me an energy to continue until today and into the future. Lily Rowe, you are the real deal. All of you, really, all board members. I know three minutes is really unfair. I know I left many others, unless. I'm stern, you said it yourself, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ferrone. Our next speaker is Marietta English. Is she here, Miss English? I don't see her, no. Um, Michelle Smith? Ms. Smith? Gloria Marrow? Good evening. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen of the board. I have come this evening to talk about children in the middle school arena, five to eight, six to eight, or seven to nine. There are several factors which affect their social and educational growth. First, they experience self-esteem factors, whereby once confident in themselves, now takes a deep dive. Secondly, Academic pressure forces them to deal with the need to excel. Thirdly, they face daily both internal and external social issues. 
In the fourth place, they become very curious and sometimes are tempted to try new things, to be accepted. And in the fifth place, there are human, biological, and hormonal factors which impact their behavior. And most of all, they fear disappointment or rejection. I feel we can help them with a team approach. Parents, teachers, counselors, administrators, and student representatives. Parents should be encouraged to visit the schools more. In school reach out clubs should be established, which will focus on students' interests and activities, as well as peer advocacy groups. The administration and several community groups, such as the D9 organizations in the county, public service private groups such as the Continental Societies, the Highlanders Incorporated, Jack and Jill of America Incorporated, the Lynx Incorporated, as well as many others in Baltimore County, can partner together to create projects and programs which are applicable to our particular age group, the middle school. School counselors can help them to understand why to study and why study is so important. The team approach is not a guarantee that things will be better, but in my opinion, it is an approach to prepare middle school students to be able to trust themselves, to be able to manage themselves appropriately in a socio-educational environment, and to be able to move forward toward the next progressive steps in the socio-educational arena. The ultimate goal in education, after all, is to help them to become contributing adults and effective social citizens in the long run. And I thank you for this time. Please have a very pleasant Thanksgiving. You do the same. Thank you. Next is Lloyd Allen. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, Chair Hen, Vice Chair McMillian, Superintendent Williams, and members of the board. Thank you for your time this evening. I'm Lloyd Allen, he, him, special educator in mathematics, speaking as an individual. Thank you. Thank you, students, for coming to school each day and learning. You are why we are here. You are why each person is at this meeting. You are why each adult in your school building is there. And you are why all of the invisible adults working behind the scenes do what they do. When I say thank you students, I mean all students. If we see you at school, then you made a choice that day to come, and I thank you for it. I hope that you feel included. I hope that you feel safe. I hope that you help each other student also feel safe. I hope that you know more things at the end of the day than you did when the day started. I hope that you get to know other students and adults in the school. I hope that you learn. I hope that every week you want to learn harder things. I hope that you get along with students who are like you and also with students who are different from you. I hope that you learn from each other, from your family, from adults, from books, from computers, and from yourself. I hope that you tell your family how you are doing at school. Thank you, parents and caregivers, for sending your students to school. Thank you for trusting us. Thank you for believing in public education. I hope that your child feels included. I hope that your child feels safe. I hope that your child helps other students feel safe. I hope that you encourage and support your child. I hope that you touch base with their teachers, both when things are going well and when you have concerns. I hope that you talk to other parents and caregivers, and I hope that you support each other and the folks working with your children. Thank you, educators. Short weeks like this one sometimes feel longer. Thank you for learning your students so that you can teach them. There is a Sanskrit word, upaya, that is often translated as skillful means. It means saying the thing that each person needs to hear in order to learn the thing right now. The thing with Upaya is that sometimes different people need to hear different things to make progress on their path. Thank you educators for staying in the fight and for trying to find the thing that each student needs to hear each moment of each day. 
Thank you, central office and admin for supporting the front lines. Thank you for the resources that we need so that we can serve the students. Thank you for the guidance on what to prioritize. Thank you for answering our questions when we have them. Thank you for listening. Thank you, board, for supporting the front lines. Thank you for the resources that we need so that we can serve the students. Thank you for listening, even when my words are adjacent to my meaning. Thank you for communicating with the community and for recognizing that the public schools include the entire community, every Thank you. Thank you. Our next and final speaker for general public comment is Ramona Basilio. Ramona Basilio. No? Okay. Next is public comment on board policies. And our speaker is Dr. Ferrone. Madam Chair, you want me to do it one at a time or all of them? It is your choice. I can do all You're of saying? them with a discount. With a discount. Policy 3000, correct? Correct. 3000, sure. 3000 is first. I thank the PRC for their due diligence in wording the policy. I do love the key word, BCPS being a model in budget planning, and the key word of accountability. I do love the semi-sentence, maximum effectiveness and efficiency. My comment about this, I wish you consider to add the word transparency or maximum transparency. Transparency is really like sunshine and it does kill viruses and bacteria. This is the end of my comment about this policy. Okay. Next is 3126. 3126. Expenses and travel reimbursement line seven and eight. Approved expenses incurred by members of the Board of Education Etc. My comment is I suggest that you would install the word reasonable before the word expenses. Reasonable. Otherwise, a person may use a luxury rental car, Sheraton or Hilton, etc. That's the end of my comment about this policy. Policy number 3127, travel approval. Line number 12 and 13 states, the school system and the decisions regarding travel should be based on needs of the students and the school system. My comment about that is again to install the word reasonable before the word needs, reasonable needs. Another thought about this policy, lines 16 and 17, states employees may be reimbursed for expenses directly related to overnight travel while conducting official business, etc. My comment is that I do suggest again the installation of the word reasonable before the word expenses. And I sincerely thank the PRC for these policies. That's the end of my comment about this one. The fourth policy is 7330, facilities and construction. And this is really important. Capital projected projects funded by private donation. My thought number one in line number nine Businesses may wish to provide funding for capital improvement, etc. My comment is, I suggest adding 
the educational advisory councils to the group. You added many other groups. My suggestion is that you consider the advisory councils to have that ability so they work for you. They work for the school system. Next thought in line 14 and 15, Baltimore County Public Schools to better meet the needs of our students. I really don't like the word better. It's really very vague and very kind of weak. Uh, what I suggest is that we use the word maximally meet our students' needs. Better can be a sliver. Line number 17, the board reserves the right to approve or reject capital projects. I suggest that you modify this and add a third word, which is to modify or negotiate. Mm -hmm. You don't want to be looked upon as rigid. It's either right or left. I think you need to offer also in between to negotiate and be flexible. Line number 23 and 24, the capital improvement proposal must comply with, 24, with the board goals and policies and the superintendent. My thought is the word must comply is really a rigid word and it will turn away donors to the school system. What I suggest that you would add that the board can offer variance or exception. Variance or exception. It gives you flexibility, give and take. Next one is line number 31 Request for naming of the capital project must comply with all board, etc. Again, I think this is really rigid. It will turn off donors. So my I am allowed 18 minutes. Uh, One minute. 19 minutes. Please finish with your comments. With the last policy. So the idea is to avoid that rigidity and to give you the idea of working with donors to kind of gain donors. You don't want to like push them away. And again, I suggest that you add the educational area councils to work for you as far as donations. This is the end of my comments about this policy. The next policy is 8350 internal board policies, operations, etc. And I hope the lawyers don't kill me. <laughs> Item number one, line number eight and 10, is authorized and empowered, that's the board, authorized and empowered to retain the services of an attorney. I really object to the word an attorney. What I recommend for you is to install the words before the word attorney, competent, trustworthy, knowledgeable, and experienced in public school matters. If you leave it in the same way, an attorney, an attorney is, could be a new graduate, could be somebody that is not experienced or knowledgeable in the school system. Second point in line number 13 and 17. Funds for legal services shall be included in the annual budget. And if the board annual, annual appropriation does not include sufficient funds for legal services required, the superintendent shall reallocate available funds for such services. My thought and this is nothing personal at all. My thought is the superintendent works for the Board of Education. So if the superintendent is going to give money to the Board of Education, to me that's kind of, you know, the power is in the money, in the purse. 
I suggest that the board would have funds, adequate funds, to take care of any legal matters. That's the end of this policy. The next policy and the last one, and I thank you for bearing with me, 8364, ethics code. Now this is really a good policy, but in line 38, 39, review by the superintendent on pertinent organizational changes would, I really like that, it is really truly spot on. There have been descriptions about retaining records, one for 10 year and another one for seven years, I believe, and it's really not clear whether we are talking about paper records or electronic records as PDF or other similar softwares. My thought to you is to consider to keep the records electronically for 100 years. I know I'm exaggerating because I have been 27 years now watching the school system and I have plenty of material on what has transpired. There would be historians that need to study the school system. And if you destroy the records in seven years or 10 years, you know, 15, 20, 25 years when my son or grandson grows up and comes to do historical work, that will be really a disservice to the school system. This policy is really very extensive, and I know the PRC has worked very hard on it. I really appreciate every other sentence that has been uh, stated. Um, Madam Chair, how many minutes did I take? Four and a half. 11. Can I save the rest for next month? <laughs> <laughs> I may not be in this seat, so. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you all. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Farron. The next item on the agenda is the report on board policies. This is the first reader for these policies, and for that I call on Ms. Lily Rowe, Chair of the Policy Review Committee. Thank you, Ms. Hen. Members of the board, the Policy Review Committee asks that the board accept this report of the committee's recommendation to amend the following board policies. Board Policy 3000, Non-Instructional Services. Board Policy 3126, Non-Instructional Services, Expense and Travel Reimbursement. Board Policy 3127, Non-Instructional Services, Travel Approval. Board Policy 7330, Facilities and Construction, Financing Capital Projects Funded by Private Donations. Board Policy 8350, Internal Board Policies, Operations and Board Council. Board Policy 8364, Internal Board Policies, Ethics Code, Financial Disclosure Statements. These policies are presented to you on tonight's Agenda Exhibit I. Okay. And I see that we have a question. Um, Ms. Scott, is your question related to the policies? Um, yes, I wanted to see if we could separate out sure. um, 8364. Sure. And that actually is already separated in my script, as a matter of fact. So, okay, I will separate that out. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. May I have a motion to accept the recommendation of the Board's Policy Review Committee for Board Policies 3000, 3126, 3127, 7330, and 8350? So moved, Taker. No second is needed since the recommendation comes from the committee. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, may I have a roll call vote? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Stolesky? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. Thank you. Um, may I have a motion to accept the recommendation of the Board's Policy Review Committee for Board Policy 8364? So moved, Stolesky. No seconds needed since the recommendation comes from the committee. Is there any discussion? Yes, Ms. Scott? Yes. Thank you. Um, I had a question about the change um, on, I believe it was item 6, page 5, 
where it was changed to from four years to ten. Um, I would like to make a motion to change it back to four years. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. That was Ms. Joes. I speak to my motion. Yes. Yes. Go ahead, Ms. Scott. Thank you. I'm not sure um, why it was changed to 10 years. I, I guess I would just be curious because as I, I looked, I wanted to ask Dr. Williams or maybe it would be Ms. Howie um, if there's if that's the norm, if there's precedence for other school systems, is that something that they're changing to from four to IRS is four years. Um, other bodies of government, I believe, are three or four years. So um, I wasn't sure if there was precedence for this, and that's why there was a change, or if this is something that's happening, and um, is there anything comparable or in another system? I was just wanting to get some background information on that. Sure. Um, Dr. Williams, would you like to respond? I will call one Ms. Howie. Okay. Yes. Good evening, Ms. Scott, members of the board. Ms. Howie, um, we're having difficulty hearing you, ma'am. Is this better? Yes, ma'am. Uh, members of the board, Ms. Scott, uh, the request for 10 years came from the committee. There is in the uh, policy analysis a list of the retention periods for financial disclosure statements from other LEAs and from county government. Uh, 10 years is the longest based on the staff's research on retention periods in other LEAs and for county government as well. Thank you, Ms. Howie. I'm looking because I, I, I see that um, on which page does it say 10? Because as I'm looking through, the majority say four. And as I indicated, 10 years was what the committee requested. Uh, that was, I would have to ask the committee to speak to the rationale uh, because that was the committee's request. That was not staff's request, nor was it based on staff's research. Okay, thank you. That's what I was trying to understand because I didn't see it supported here in the in the information. I didn't wasn't aware of it either, so I was wondering where it came from. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Ms. Joes. Thank you, thank you, Ms. Uh, Howie, for clarifying that. I'm looking at it, and all of the county boards of education, St. Mary's, Queen Anne's, all of Maryland. Um, have four years. IRS requires you to keep your your um, the Internal Revenue Service only requires you to keep it for three years um, and maybe six three years. You audit and maybe six years. So this to me seems to be a bit of an overkill. This is the financial disclosure records that would be retained for the board members and some cabinet staff. Uh, we are not bigger than the IRS, and we certainly are not the Department of Justice. I don't know where this recommendation came from, but I can see it being misused and abused to intimidate people. Um, I would not be supporting the 10 years, which is, I think, a bit too much. Um, four years is what all of the jurisdictions are doing, and I think we need to stick to that. So... Um, I support Ms. Scott's motion to strike it back to the original four years. And thank you, Ms. Howie. You are the legal expert in here um, that works in policy. So thank you for the analysis. Thank you, Ms. Joes. Ms. Rowe, if you could speak to the committee's decision. So Please. there were members of the committee that um, recall that the UHY audit um, came up with findings and results based on financial disclosures forms and that there were several years that they could not come up with, um, they could not examine because the financial disclosure forms had already been destroyed for those years. And since the audit was over a course of more than four years, members of the committee wanted to have um, this change to 10 years so that it could encompass other legislative audits and external audits. So that was the reasoning behind um, the decision of the committee. Thank you. Dr. Hager? Um, just briefly, I also support this motion, and, and I agree that uh, 10 years is overkill, and I'm, I'm grateful to the 
um, work of the office to, to look at the other uh, jurisdictions and what they're doing because I think that we should be in line with, with what the other school systems are doing. Thank you. Ms. Jones, and then Ms. Causey. Yeah, I just want to rebut the UHY external audit that was done since I do serve now currently on the audit committee. Um, that was not the reasoning for keeping records of 10 years. We do keep records as required by Maryland State Archives. Anything beyond that was destroyed. So that was not our purview to go dig into the past. And, and I'm going to give a personal experience out here that before the late Mr. Roger Hayden was dying, uh, somebody did pull his financial rec records to intimidate him, and he was very upset about it. And you know who you are. Um, that was a shameful thing to do to a man that was dying. Uh, and that that is what this thing is going to be used to, to intimidate, um, to pull records of people that you have a grudge or an ax to grind. I think we should agree with what the law states, four years. Heck, I would even support six years if need be, but 10 years is an overkill. And I will not be supporting that excessive retention um, this we are, we're not federal agents over here. Mrs. Causey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I would support the, the uh, policy staying as it is for 10 years. Um, legislative audits um, occur anywhere from five to six years, and they have a look back of from the last time they did an audit. So if they did an audit a little bit early and then they do one a little bit late, they may be looking back as far as six, seven, or eight years. I would also say that uh, board members have the opportunity to serve for 12 years, uh, and there are other uh, employees and staff that have unlimited tenure. Um, and ethics financial disclosure statements are required of board members and staff because we have a significant role in the expenditures of up to $2 billion budget per year. Uh, and it is important to have accountability and transparency. Um, and so that is why the 10-year uh, time frame um, was selected. Uh, and also in terms of how other districts are doing it, unfortunately, our district has had a specific, very negative situation involving uh, ethics financial disclosure statements where we have, uh, as a board, worked to increase accountability and transparency uh, to rebuild trust with our communities around uh, these issues of uh, using every dollar fiscally responsibly. Um, so I would support uh, maintaining those records. Uh, I believe it does no harm, and it certainly can do some good. Thank you. I would like to speak to this motion um, from a very practical standpoint. Um, our contract for the procurement audit, um, by the time that was initiated, the scope of that contract was for a five-year time span. Um, phase one of that contract, that work, did not kick off until almost two years after. Um, so we're talking about forms that would have been retained seven years after the fact. Um, according to a four-year retention policy, those forms would have been destroyed by the time that audit would have started. So I'm going to outline this. Um, the scope of that audit was from 2012 through 2017, a five-year scope. By the time the work started, those forms were seven years old, the oldest forms. That was phase one. Phase two, which were, was actually to look at the majority of those forms, those forms would have then aged at least 10 years by the time phase two would have um, been started. So by the time phase two started, without a 10-year retention policy in place, according to this change that's being proposed, those forms would have been destroyed. So in other words, the recommended scope of this audit, which was not initiated by this board, but rather by the former superintendent, would have been moot because the necessary evidence to perform this audit, and by evidence, I'm not using that in any type of criminal or nefarious sense, the evidence for the audit. I'm sorry, Mrs. Hahn, did you have something to add? Point of order. That was me speaking. That's Ms. Scott speaking. Yes, I do, I do have something to add. Would you like me to add it now? No, I have the floor. Okay, thank you. The time I'm happy to add if you would like. The audit documents that were needed okay. for the audit would have been destroyed had we had this policy in place. A 10-year span is necessary, which is why the policy committee supported it. 
so I will not be supporting this because um, it would would not have provided the documents that were necessary, which had been destroyed, which made this audit moot to begin with. Are there any other comments before I call a roll call vote? Mr. Kuhn? Oh, thank you. So I have no fear of these financial disclosures being misused. They're, they're publicly available for the entire time we're on the board and beyond. Um, the reality is, and, and a main driver of why I even joined this board, was we had ethical lapses at the very top. We had a superintendent that went to jail for lying Point of on their order. financial disclosure Point form. Point of order. I'm sorry, I'm speaking. Point of order. Nope. Or, point of order. Yeah, point of order. What is your point of order? My point of order is that that slanderous language or things that are going on that has no place in what we're discussing. We are discussing what the policy is and the amount of time. The referral to previous employees and everything I think is out of line. I'm That's sorry, but, the, but history shows someone point went to of jail order. Point because of, order. of lying on the point financial disclosure order. form. Point of order. You can point of order all night long. Point of order. I can speak when point it's my turn to order. speak. It is point Mr. of order. Ms. Scott, it's Mr. Kuhn. Is my point of order held? Is it no, recognized? It is not recognized. Mr. Kuhn is speaking directly to the financial disclosure forms and the criminal indictment of the former superintendent for perjury on his financial disclosure forms is relevant. Point Mr. of order Kuhn sounds like you're speaking continue. to that. Sounds like an attack. So I will continue to make my point, thank you, that financial disclosure forms are important. We've had people come up this very day and talk about transparency and sunlight. And I don't believe destroying forms after four years makes any sense. Financial, financial documents should be saved seven years at the very least. And 10 years is not a long time to save financial disclosure forms. So in the environment we're in and the ethical lapses that have occurred in the past, I find it prudent to simply say, okay, 10 years is fine, and I will be supporting this. And I see no reason why any board member on this board would speak against it. It, 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 it boggles my mind. Thank you. Thank you. May I have a roll call vote, please, Ms. Gover? Point of order. Excuse me. I had a Your question in the chat. I had a question in the chat that was had, raised before you. Ms. Um, Scott, everyone has had a chance to yes, speak Yes, but to I this still have motion. time left. My, is, my two minutes is not up. I still have time left, and I had a question. I'm calling the, the roll call vote. Everyone okay, has so had you're a ignoring that I had a question that I everyone put in the chat that Scott I raised time. before the time was up. Ms. Scott, everyone has had a chance to speak to this motion. But I still have times. more time, and I had a question, and I had a point to raise. And I have time to do that. And I asked before it, um, before you called for the roll call vote. McMillian, you have not spoken to the motion. Thank so you. So you're ignoring me. Okay. I don't have a lot. And what I have is just not a lot to it. And I feel that 10 years is too much, even though I have nothing. I think that it goes along with the other school systems. If I looked at that list and every one I pulled up that I saw said four years. So if that's good enough for 10 or 12 or 14 other school systems in the state of Maryland, it's good enough for me. Thank you. There's a motion and a second on the floor. Has anyone who's not had a chance to speak to this motion had a, a chance to speak to it? Ms. Lulowski? Um The only thing that I'm going to add, I understand everybody's points, is maybe we put a motion in for some kind of compromise at seven years that's split right in the middle. So, Ms. Scott, this was your motion. Would you please restate your motion? I'd like to finish speaking to my motion because I was not yet finished speaking to my motion. Would you please restate it and then you may um, speak to it? My motion was that I would, I move that we change on, um, in section six, 10 years to four years. Thank you. Please finish speaking to your motion. 
only other thing I would like to speak to my motion is that there were a lot of things that were said that aren't relative and aren't pertinent to today. There are people bringing issues from the previous board, personal issues that they've had that have nothing to do with this current board, have nothing to do with the board going forward. We as a system, we, the students, the parents are trying to move forward. And those board members who sit around here and hold us in the past on the stranglehold of something that happened that most of us weren't even around for, but are trying to move past is categorically unfair and it's irresponsible. Thank you. Ms. Joes, you had a comment? Yes, I want to state that, um, and probably for Ms. Howie, that the other LEAs, they get their financial disclosures audited, correct, for the four years. Um, and I looked at the UHY report extensively. I do believe Dr. Dance's forms were not destroyed, so there's a lot of misconception going around here. In fact, there are board members here that had not submitted their disclosures on time, and that was a finding. Um, and I am a salaried person. I have nothing against keeping my financials out there. I don't have multiple businesses. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. So I don't see why for a local school board, um, I have nothing to hide, why you would want to keep it excess of what's required by law. We certainly are not lawyers. Like Ms. Hennis reminded me, we're not contract lawyers, neither are we legislative lawyers. Um, I think four years is what others have done, and we should be safe with sticking with um, and Clifton Larson, our auditor, does that's, an audit every year. That's time, Ms. Joes. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Gilbert, may I have a roll call vote, please? This is on the amendment. This is on the, there's no amendment. This, this is the motion to amend the policy. There was a suggestion for an amendment, but there was an actual vote or something. Yes, there's a motion. There was a motion and a second. Oh, Ms. Pilosky did not amend the motion. We, we are voting on Ms. Scott's motion. Yes, I am sorry. Yes, it's an amendment to Lily's motion. To the policy, right. To the policy. Yes. Thank you. The, the motion is to amend the policy. Ms. Rowe? No. Ms. Causey? No. Ms. Stolesky? No. Ms. Jose? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Mrs. Song? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? No. Ms. Hen? No. Favor is five. So that motion fails. Now we um, have a we have a motion on the floor to approve the policy as recommended by the policy review committee. And that was moved by whom? Mr. Lusky. Mr. Lusky. And seconded by, there was no second needed because it was made by the committee. May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Stolesky? Yeah. Ms. Jose? No. Mr. McMillian? No. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Sorry. Uh, Ms. Scott? No. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Favor is seven. That carries. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is action taken in closed session, and for that I call on Mr. Mercedes. Good evening. Earlier the board met in closed session in its quasi-judicial capacity to render decisions in two cases. HE 22-18 and HE 23-11. The board rendered decision in those cases in closed session. Now would be an appropriate time for the board to confirm uh, the vote taken in closed session. 
May I have a motion to approve the action taken in closed session on hearing examiner cases HE 22-18 and 23-11 and authorize Ms. Gover to sign for those board members not physically present? So moved, Roe. Is there a second? Second, Hassan. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Dulesky? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Hem? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. The motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mercedes. The next item on the agenda is the report on the fiscal year 2022 annual comprehensive financial report. And for that, I call on Mr. Hartlove. Good evening. Good evening, board members. Uh, we were bringing forward the annual uh, financial audit, which is required by uh, Maryland state law. Um, we have a clean uh, uh, audit and we have uh, Ms. Sherry Amos from Clifton Larson Allen on Teams. If you have any questions, we did uh, go through this at the most recent audit committee meeting. Uh, we had some questions and some good follow-up and, um, and uh, so, we have we have discussed it at, at some at some level of detail. Okay. Thank you. Board members, any questions, Mr. Kuhn? Well, thank you. Um, just a quick question. There, there's been a significant money of fed, um, amount of federal money moving through the ESSER grants um, to our school system and, and across the country. Are there any plans to specifically audit some of that spending? Um, it's, it's, so, it's so large, it's just it's a tremendous amount of money. Do we have any plans to do that or have a third party do that? Um, no, no doubt. That's not really a decision that we make. That is a, uh, and Ms. Uh, Ms. Amos can probably uh, chime in here. Um, but there will be a ramp up in the in the uh, exposure. So I don't know, um, Ms. Amos, if you can answer that question. Sure, I can definitely address that. So that um, the allowability and the spending of those funds is specifically covered under the single audit, which is the audit of the federal grant expenditures. Um, it was audited last year for the 63021 audit, um, and it will also be audited again um, this year for the 63022 audit. That audit is not due to the state until 123122, and we're currently in progress with that audit. So it is not finalized and issued at this point, but it, the ESSER grants are subject and are part of that, that single audit that we're currently is in progress. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Joes? Thank you. Uh, this was presented to the audit committee. Um, so, Ms. Emos, thank you for that. And it, it's a comprehensive financial audit that's required by law. And BCPS does this uh, annually for those that misunderstood financial disclosures are personal. It has nothing to do with auditing of our school procurement and other things that uh, Clifton Larson does on an annual basis as required by law. Um, so thank you. I read through the report and thank you for your presentation. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Other comments or questions, board members? Hearing none. Thank you, Mr. Hartlow. Thank you. Okay. The next item on the agenda is the report on the Northeast and Southeast Area High School Studies. And for that, I call on Dr. Williams and Mr. Dixon. So Madam Chair Hinn and Vice Chair McMillian and members of the board tonight, the board will be receiving the reports on the Northeast and Southeast Area High School Studies. We have Mr. Dave, we have Mr. Lee. Excuse me, we have Mr. David Rashia, Vice President of uh, JMT Architects will present the Southeast Area High School study. And we have Mr. Lee, Principal of Shamaha Associates, PC Architects, who will present the Northeast Area High School study. And of course, we have Mr. Pete Dixit, our Executive Director. Mr. So, Dixit. good evening, board. I'll just give you a little bit of context of what we are doing today. Uh, in 2020, as you'll recognize, as you'll remember, um, 
we, with the help of Baltimore County government, conducted what we called a multi-year improvement plan for all schools. That was to prioritize needs for capital improvement. As part of uh, my pass, uh, all of the elementary, high schools, and middle schools were studied and their priority established. There were some part of that study, especially the southeast area high schools and northeast area high schools, where the consultant recommended that we take a deeper dive and look into different options uh, before we implement projects. Uh, on the northeast side, the schools were Kenwood High School, Lock Raven High School, Overly High School, Parkville High School, and Perry Hall High School. On the southeast side, it was Dundalk, Patapsco, and Sparrows Point High School. So we have two different consultants, uh, one studying the southeast part and the other northeast part. Um, before I go into that, I just wanted to thank Dr. Mustafer, uh, Dr. Eric Wilson, Larissa Santos, and Jennifer Mullinex for their support on the educational side, uh, leadership of Dr. Williams for the entire project, and members of my team, uh, Meryl Plate, Paul Taylor, Melissa Appler, Mike Archbold, Katie Angstead, and Doug Mullins. These are the team members that were involved, so I wanted to share those names with you. Uh, because of some situation with the Northeast area, we are going to be presenting Southeast area first. So I have Dave Rescia who will be making the presentation. Thank you. Dave? Do we want to pull up the uh, Southeast area study? Yeah, it's been, uh, yeah. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Dave Risha. I'm vice president with JMT Architecture, and I, I head up our uh, K through 12 education studio. Um, Baltimore County Public Schools in the My iPass study, as Mr. Dixit said, uh, identified three high schools in the southeast area um, to address overcrowding, <coughs> excuse me, facility conditions, and educational adequacy. Uh, the study was undertaken to determine possible solutions to relieve these issues and enhance the uh, environment for the students, teachers, and the staff. Next slide, please. Our scope of services, uh, as, as listed here, we were to evaluate up to six options to relieve overcrowding at Sparrows Point Middle, uh, and, uh, Middle Point and High School and Patapsco High School. Um, we were determined if any of the existing structures were listed on MHT's list of historic structures or if they were determined to meet the eligibility requirements. We were determined to determine the impact of site characteristics including the topography, soils, environmental, safety, and other considerations. Then we were to prepare concept sketches for each option. We were to meet with the community to review these options and prepare conceptual cost estimates for each of these options. And then finally, prepare a report with the, with the design team's recommendations. So as you see here, the schedule was, was pretty voluminous. We started uh, with the notice to proceed on November 3rd. Um, we had uh, work sessions uh, through December, in January, and into February. We had our first community input meeting, which was a virtual meeting on, May, on March 2nd. And we followed that up two weeks later with a live community input meeting, presenting the same information uh, to, the, to the community. After that, we had some more work sessions. And then we had our, our third community input meeting, and again, another live meeting on April 21st, uh, draft progress reports in May and Ju July, draft reported submitted in September, um, review meeting in October, and a final report at the end of October. So our study options, we originally considered six options. 
Uh, we presented those at those first two uh, meeting, the virtual and the live meeting. Uh, the community basically accepted two and said four were not acceptable. Uh, the community then offered uh, an additional six sites for consideration. Um, of those six, only three were possible uh, due to uh, commitments on those sites or unavailability. So I'll walk you through uh, the options that were considered after that, that first live meeting. Uh, option one is sort of a, uh, a dominoes. We were looking at constructing a replacement ele elementary school at Edgemere uh, for Edgemere and Chesapeake Terrace. And after that, the, uh, the, the building at Chesapeake Par Terrace would be demolished. Then a const construct a replacement middle school for Sparrows Point at Chesapeake Terrace. And then we would renovate and add on to Sparrows Point High School, creating an, a like new high school for, for Sparrows Point. And then construct additions for Patapsco High School. Option six, limited the site work to the existing uh, Sparrows Point site. We would construct a new middle school on that site and then add on and renovate the existing building to a like new high school for Sparrows Point and then construct additions again at Patapsco High School. And you'll see that is a, that is a, a, a common that happens through all of these. 6A is the same as six, option six. Uh, with the exception that there's a, a piece of property owned by Baltimore County adjacent to Sparrows Point. And the idea there was that if the, the school system could obtain that, that property, the recreation space uh, available for the new middle school and the existing high school could be expanded uh, to meet the programmatic needs of those two facilities. Uh, option seven, would be uh, creating a new elementary school on a site that would be determined from what, what we saw left of the, of the six, the one, the one through three sites. So that would, you would construct a new elementary school there that would com again combine uh, uh, the Edgemere and the um, Chesapeake Terrace elementary schools. They would then vacate the Chesapeake Terrace site. A new middle school would be built there for Sparrows Point and then uh, Sparrows Point would be renovated uh, into a like new and added on to into a like new uh, high school and then construct additions at, at Patapsco. Option eight would be to find a new site to construct a, a middle school for Sparrows Point. Uh, that would take the uh, middle school students out of the existing building, allowing that building to be renovated and added on to make it a like new uh, high school and then construct additions at Patapsco. And then option uh, nine is, again, find a site big enough to construct an all-new high school uh, for Sparrows Point, and then uh, renovate the existing building uh, into the middle school. I mean, the building is sizable, uh, much larger than is necessary for middle school, so there'd be a lot of supplemental uh, space in there that wouldn't have necessarily have a use by the, by the school system. And then uh, construct... Um, uh, additions at at, at uh, uh, Patapsco High School. So those were the those were the options that uh, came out of the the second meeting we had with the community. Next slide, please. So this is sort of a summary of all of the all of the schemes that we did, the initial six plus the ones that came out of the the community meeting. We looked at all of the properties that were owned by uh, the public school system in the area to determine if there was a holistic approach that could be used to, to resolve the overcrowding at, at Patapsco and at, at Sparrows Point. And then uh, we bought, through that, the second community meeting, um, the first live community meeting, uh, identified by the, by the community, the various sites owned by DNR and the state and private ownership that uh, they, would they would like us to look at uh, to relieve the, the overcrowding down there. Next slide, please. So our recommendations. Um, this all came out of the, the community meeting. Basically, the community made it very clear on the, uh, the first live meeting we had that the uh, students of uh, Sparrows Point uh, should remain on, on the peninsula. They should, they should stay there 
uh, and a solution needed to be, needs to be found to keep all the students there. Uh, as a, as a, a side issue for that, because of um, keeping the students on the peninsula, uh, Patapsco High School uh, should be treated as a separate project. Uh, there's no real holistic approach that can be used to, to try to relieve overcrowding in both of those schools if the students uh, need to stay on the, on the peninsula. So that would, that would stay uh, a separate project and could start uh, when funding becomes available. So our recommendations, we boiled down to, to three recommendations. And, and each one of these, you need to understand that um, there are caveats to each one of these, um, some with the existing sites, some trying to find a, a new site that, to make these things happen. So option six and 6A, again, to review that, that would be um, construct a middle school at the Sparrows Point site for Sparrows Point Middle School. You would renovate and add on to Sparrows Point High School uh, to make it a like new high school. And then if that property owned by Baltimore County adjacent to it becomes available, bring that into the, into the program so that the recreational spaces and the site amenity spaces could be uh, expanded. The caveat to that in red, as you see there, uh, MDE has uh, classified the land as LDA and LDA is extremely limiting as, as to what you can do with it. In fact, um, under LDA, you can't have what you have there currently. The, um, the civil engineer and, and landscape architect who uh, consultant, uh, site resources, who was working with us on the project stated that they felt that LDA was a misclassification and that really IDA was the classification that should be used. Um, and as such, then the development that we proposed uh, could occur, uh, but that would take work with uh, MDE to to have that uh, have them revise the designation of the of the property. Option seven was our second recommendation uh, to find a site for a new elementary school uh, that could combine Edgemere and Chesapeake Terrace uh, onto that parcel. That again would open up the Chesapeake Terrace parcel for development of a new middle school for Sparrows Point. And then we would renovate the existing uh, Sparrows Point building and add on to it to make it a like new high school um, and uh, add on to uh, Patapsco. Again, that becomes a separate, a separate project. Uh, but again, the caveat to there is finding a parcel suitable uh, to support the new elementary school and finding land that, that's available for, uh, for purchase. And then option eight, uh, find a site for a new middle school for Sparrows Point in and of itself, um, renovate the existing building uh, to become a new Sparrows Point, a like new Sparrows Point High School. And again, that requires finding a parcel that's suitable uh, for, the, for the new middle school. Any questions? Yes, Mr. Kuhn. Well, thank you for this presentation. It's very informative. I know there's severe limitations of open land right all through Baltimore County. Um, from your presentation, you kind of annotate certain areas that, are, are those areas available? Because you highlight like a, a, a golf club, you know, hire like, hire like DNR, are those spaces available for purchase? These, these, were the, these were the spaces that were suggested by the community in our first live um, community meeting. Um, some of those have been investigated. There were six that were, that were uh, shown. Um, three were investigated and determined they were not available. Uh, the other three, um, I think there's some limitations as to how anyone can uh, approach them to determine their availability. But that's, that's why we recommended uh, three possible solutions at the end, because that's all going to take uh, a lot of additional work to, f to figure out if any of those three properties, or if there's other properties in the, in the peninsula that are available uh, for both uh, purchase or uh, uh, compatibility with the, the use and the size required for these new facilities. So has your team, or let me ask, have you been tasked with finding a large enough parcel for a school in the area? No, we haven't. Okay, it, all right, so you just basically took what was thrown out at you in public meetings, took a look at it, determined whether 
it's possible or not, and, and that's kind of where we are, right? Looked at it, uh, the civil engineer looked at it from an environmental standpoint and a grading standpoint um, to say, yes, they, they, they might be able to support the school, but we've made no contact with, with the owners of those properties. All right, thank you. Thank you. Um, I believe Dr. Hager was next. Um, yes, very quick question. It was an excellent presentation. Um, is Chesapeake Terrace on the Spurs Point Peninsula, so would that property be acceptable to the community for a middle or high school? Yes. And then does the community then request that the new elementary school also be in the same vicinity on the peninsula? It, it, all the, the, the statement was made that the students of, Spar of the Sparrows Point Peninsula should stay on the Sparrows Point Peninsula. All around. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Rowe? Yeah, so one of the concerns I have that I would just like to bring up, and I'm not sure that if it's something that um, you guys can even answer or not, but so the Sparrows Point Peninsula, if the students for the, the peninsula are staying on the peninsula, um, how are we going to deal with the extra students um, who will come to the come to those schools as a result of housing projects and residential construction being approved based on the capacity at Chesapeake High School on the other side of a body of water. And so we have children who are going to occupy those brand new houses and more developments being approved, but those children have to stay on the peninsula. So are these expansions going to meet the needs of all the future developments that are planned for the peninsula? Because the meetings that I've seen, the approvals are based on capacity at Chesapeake High School, which is across an entire body of water with no bridges and don't believe the school system owns ferries. So how are we accommodating that? I, I can't answer that directly other than, other than to say that the, the, the school system provided us with um, SRCs in terms of uh, the sizes of the schools that would need to meet um, and, and how, that would, how that would relieve the overcrowding, and I believe create um, uh, space in there for, for some new students. Beyond that, I, I, I don't know what planning has been done uh, to, addru to address those, those new houses that are going in there. So, Mr. Dixit? Yeah, so I'll try to add a little bit to that information. The projections, uh, the, the capacity utilization and projections indicate that there are three schools that have the issue. They did Dundalk, uh, Patapsco, and this Paris Point. And um, we are building an addition at Dundalk to relieve that. There's, uh, this study recommends another addition at Patapsco, and that's going to take care of another situation there. So this situ the only thing that remains is handling this Paris Point. So at this point, that's our focus. Thank you. Mrs. Stolowski? Thank you for the presentation. Um, so in understanding that the school would have to remain on the peninsula, I'm looking at the map, and it, is it that the peninsula s sort of splits into two, and the, the west side or the left side is Sparrows Point, is labeled Sparrows Point, and the right side is labeled Edgemere, but those would both be considered the peninsula that's right okay that they're, they're still part of the same peninsula okay. yeah and then with that it looks like the east side or the right side has is, is the only side that would have the available green space well is that is that our understanding that it would have to be so green on the map to be cleared or available for a new school to be built or is that incorrect so available space is what we don't know at this point. Okay. Okay, that's, that's the issue. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Joes? Thank you, and thank you for this presentation. Um, in 2018, we had a high school capacity study done, and we were told by staff at that point, uh, and this is four years ago, that we had to make a decision for the southeast area because if we didn't in 10 years, we would be intense, the, the schools would be so overcrowded if we were in a peninsula. We've heard all this before and this board did fail to make a decision. 
Um, it's four years later and we're here we are, but at least we've made some progress. Um, you mentioned option six and six A and you said it requires further investigation regarding the intensely developed and limited development. Are those the Chesapeake Bay critical areas um, designations? Because if that's that those are just Chesapeake Bay critical areas, those are really hard to to uh, remove. Um, as generally as a civil engineer, we avoid any development on any Chesapeake Bay critical areas. So could you clarify um, your six option six A LDA versus IDA option that you were considering for the investigation? Yes, the 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 civil engineer did the research on the on the property and uh, and identified the the IDA LDA um, issue uh, in in, dis in discussing it with them, um, they they feel that it is if they can get the designation changed, there is the possibility to proceed with that development. But again, it's a it's a caveat that that needs to be needs to be uh, vetted to make sure that it that it is going to work. So you would be coming back to the board further refining these three options that you've now considered to kind of zero in on one final recommendation. I, I believe that that our that our work on this, unless unless directed otherwise, our work on this is is pretty well complete. So then it's up to the school system and the board to make the decision. If it, to pursue to pursue additional study, pursue. yes. Okay, thank you, Mr. Dixon. Did you add anything to add to that? So we, these are the options that consultant has recommended. Uh, we'll be working with our fiscal partners, uh, uh, the county and the state, and we'll be looking at all the potential sites. And then whatever decision is made, we'll come back to board uh, as a project within our capital improvement program for your approval. Thank you. Mrs. Causey and then Mr. McMillian. Thank you. Um, thank you for this presentation. Um, we have been hearing about uh, Sheriff Chang. Mrs. Causey, could you turn your mic on, please? Thank you. Um, Thank you for your presentation. Thank you for your work. Um, we have been hearing about Sparrows Point, Patapsco, uh, Dundalk uh, for some time. We also, with the board uh, had and the county government, had a joint task force uh, on addressing the uh, adequate facilities and how the uh, developments uh, that are approved by the county impact and, um, and almost make it impossible for the school board to keep up with the populations uh, in certain areas. Um, and that is because the county council uh, has not taken that up as an issue. Um, what is necessary to have staff immediately pursue the availability of these additional sites? Because I know uh, board member McMillian has specifically asked about certain sites uh, a long time ago in terms of their availability um, to be a part of the feasible solution. So like I indicated before, this this solution is for three different schools now. So part of the issue is resolved by uh, constructing an addition at Dundalk High School, which is being designed right now. The second piece could be, as we see from the consultant's recommendation, is an addition uh, at Patapsco High School. So that, in our mind, will take care of uh, more than half of the capacity needs. So the final piece has to be at the Sparrows Point, and that's the one that we are working with our uh, partners in trying to identify a site or in trying to be able to get one of these um, land designation changes. So that is still work in progress. So when you say working with funding partners, uh, does that mean that the school system and the Board of Ed needs someone else to give us permission to see if a site's available to purchase? So when, whenever we are looking for a site, we work with Baltimore County to, uh, you know, because they are the ones who pay for site and we work with them. So our planning and their planning, they, we work together. 
to identify a site. And that work is very much in progress. So uh, what's the estimated time of when you'll uh, have additional information to bring to the board? We don't know at this time as to when we are going to be finding a site. I'll reserve my time. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, and I have a follow-up, and then Mr. McMillian's been waiting patiently, but um, Mr. Dixit, you said that these recommendations meet the current known capacity needs. Those are based on current enrollment projections, correct, but not which are forecast based on the previous pupil yields and not the new pupil yields that were just released and, in fact, have not been released publicly. Is that so an accurate statement? So as you know, we prepare enrollment projections every year. And when we prepare enrollment projections, it's for one year through seven, eight, ten years. So this is all of the projections that we have. Based on that, this is the major chunk of the issues that we have, these three schools. Now, there will always be minor fluctuations in all schools, but this is the major part of the problem that we have to take care of. Correct, but we don't adjust the pupil yields annually, correct? So pupil Based yield on the is a part of methodology that is used for enrollment projections, and, and we have just completed pupil yield study, so that will be applied. So every year we update projections based on the latest information. We do, we but we don't do, the update, we don't do an annual pupil yield study. That's only updated every four years, is that it? Periodically Correct. is the best I can tell you now. You know, it's not done For five every years. Year. Yeah. So yeah. we have new pupil yield information that that has not been updated in four or so years. I, I don't recall the frequency. Yeah. And that could inform these recommendations, but did did not inform those. That could inform the board that there there could be additional capacity needs, and I'm speaking generally towards both studies now. So enrollment projection can change both ways, plus and minus. So yes, you are correct, there will be fluctuation, and that's why they are done every year. And what's the reason I ask, and this touches on what um, Mrs. Causey said, and I believe she spoke to the recommendations of the Adequate P Public Facilities Ordinance Task Force, is part of those recommendations um, directly affects how we calculate um, or the requirements for how pupil yields are calculated. So there are multiple things at play here. One is we've improved our methodology for pupil yield. The task force made recommendations to improve um, the pupil yield determination. All of that goes into play with how um, our accurate our enrollment projections are going to be. And yes, it's, it's understood that that can affect things both ways. However, when, when we look at these recommendations to say that they are, they're going to meet our um, capacity needs, we're not looking at rec the latest data in, in terms of what our pupil yields may look like. So I'm taking this with a, a grain of salt in terms of what, how many seats we're going to need in both of these studies. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. McMillian. It seems like I'm out of time. Good evening, gentlemen. Good evening. I've got a lot of questions, and I don't want to run out of time. Mr. Rashid, your document was 52 or 56 pages long, the total document? I, I believe that's correct. So you just went through, you, and I understand, you saved time, and you picked and chose what you shared with us that you thought was the most important document. The, the, a summary of, of what we did, yes. Fort Howard, what did you come up with? Did you analyze Fort Howard? We we looked at it we looked at it from a uh, environmental standpoint and I believe we looked at it from a uh, uh, availability and it was not available. Okay. Uh, Trade Point Atlantic, anything there? Um, Trade Point Atlantic, we we looked at it again from an environmental standpoint. I don't I don't believe what the outcome of that of that was. Okay. Uh, Mr. Dixit, if I'm not mistaken. These studies together cost five hundred thousand dollars, or each one cost five hundred thousand dollars. I don't have the cost, but I can share that with you later on. Yeah. So you can't tell me right now. I don't what know. They cost. No. no. no with, I, with the actual, we had budgeted, if I'm not mistaken, five hundred thousand dollars, and I'm yeah. not sure if it's a split. Mr. Platt might know. He's shaking his head. Do, to you, do you have the number, Mr. Platt? Maybe. No, I don't. No. Okay, so it was. It was we can get that. Five hundred thousand dollars for the two, or it was five hundred thousand dollars a piece. For both. Well, 
The allot was 500 for each, Mr. Plate is saying, and we don't know how much we spent. We, we can get okay. that for you. So if there's any money left over, can we direct it, you know, to try to analyze these other, yeah. these other properties? Uh, uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, okay, is it accurate that architects have walked Patapsco High School recently? to look at design issues? I don't know. I know Patapsco was renovated not too long ago. Yeah, but yeah. I, I was told by teachers there that j just here, I was in the school building last week. Yeah. They told me that architects had walked the school building. So in anticipation of the of the uh, addition. I, I don't know. I can get that for you. But today's presentation is uh, for our southeast area in general, not for any specific school. Okay. Okay. Uh, so you're not going to go out on the limb and give us any sort of timeline? Timeline for what? For the next step on where we, where we are in purchasing these properties. Oh, we don't know whether the properties are available or not. If we knew, we will share that with you. So I do want to, uh, to share with the board, nothing will be done without board's approval. And board will be informed as soon as we know about it. If we know that there is a property that we are buying, board will know about it. If it's going to be included in capital program, board will know about it. So there is nothing there that anybody can hide. Okay. And let's shift to Dundalk real quick. Yes. Dundalk High School, we approved, was it a 40 or $50 million renovation addition to Dundalk? So the amount we have in the capital program that we, you approved last year, so we, we can get those numbers. Today's focus is on these presentations. We'll come back to you in very short time when we'll present to you county capital program, okay. and you'll get to see numbers now, again. If I'm not mistaken, we were yeah. told that Dundalk would be 650 students over by 25, 26. And Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Hager? So is it, what's the likelihood that these, um, that new Southeast High School would be included in the next capital proposal that you present to the board? That's, uh, well, based on whatever we have, it appears that Patapsco High School addition is being recommended here in all options. Okay. So we'll be working with our funding partners okay. subject to their approval. We'll come to you and we'll share that program with you. For Next fall, we are, we're likely to see an addition to Patapsco, but the Sparrows Point, because we need property, could be two years, three years down the road. Yeah, and again, you said next fall you'll see the addition for uh, Patapsco. Sorry. No. So this is, it's a, it's a design process and it's bidding process. So right now, when board approved Dundalk High School addition a couple of years ago, we are in the design process, yeah, and amazing. then it takes another year or so, uh, 18 months to complete the construction. So I don't want to leave the impression that next fall there will be an addition in oh, yeah. No, no, no. I meant, okay. I meant it, the, ball will, the ball will begin to start rolling yes. at least on yes. that by next fall. Yes. Okay. yes. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Causey? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I would like to uh, make a motion that the board approve searching for a site for uh, Sparrows Point Middle School and uh, that Mr. McMillian would be on a uh, committee to do that work. I'll second that. Second row. So there's a second by Mr. McMillian. Would you like to speak to your motion? Uh, yes. So this board, and I'm very proud of this board, in that we have uh, in moved away from what people are willing to give us to asking for what we need for every community, for every student. We know there's been a need, there's been studies, there's been conversation, and when I hear a colleague board member ask a year ago about a certain site being available and then there's no additional information, that's very concerning moving forward. So I, I think... Uh, and I, I do know there's precedents for other uh, colleagues and uh, board members that have uh, 
been engaged in looking at properties and sites for different school programs, um, and that's part of the uh, benefit of having elected school board members from your district. They're embedded in the community. They're very aware of issues. So I don't recall if it's the first time I met Mr. McMillian, but it's one of the first times I met Mr. McMillian was at a magistrate hearing in which um, the Fort Howard Community Association was attempting to oppose a housing development because the development um, was going to overcrowd Sparrows Point High School and the justification for building that development, even though that school and Patapsco were overcrowded, was that Chesapeake High School on the other side of a body of water was an adjacent school zone. That was four years ago. Out of that came out um, a study that the county council did to review their laws that they have not even presented to the county council session. And so Mr. McMillian has been in a position to be listening to his community talk about these schools and talk about these issues and look at this overcrowding situation for some time now. And I feel like that Continuing that work with a special committee to actually get some answers for this community would be appropriate, so I support this motion. Thank you. Ms. Jones, is your question related to the motion on the floor? I'm sorry, Ms. Jones, is your question related to the motion on the floor? Yes, I want to ask um, Mr. Dixit, is the county council the county executive's office working on this as well is there something um, because we do not have authority to purchase property is that something that we're working collaboratively with them to look into buying property or um, something similar to that so the always superintendent's team and the county executive teams work continuously together uh, to look at the site to look at the funds for projects. So it's a continuous process. And yes, we are doing that. So is this then a duplicative um, effort if the county council, or the office is also looking um, at lands and looking and talking to owners? So I'm just trying to see where, because Mr. McMillan has advocated for this since day one. He sat next to me on the board and um, I got to know a lot about it. Um, unfortunately, we didn't, you know, approve the mighty pass. So, um, you know, I, I do believe he needs to be involved, but I'm trying to see if it's a duplicative effort or if it makes sense for him to work directly with you, you guys in the county council to to get what's best for the southeast area. Dr. Williams, do you want to respond? I don't know if Mr. Dixon can respond to that question, Ms. Jones, but I will just remind the board. I want to thank JMT. You did what the work was required, and you came back with a recommendation. The recommendation was presented to the board. We don't own any land. Of course, we will have to do more work with those who own land and with our partners, our county executive, our county council. So I just want to thank you all. You, we agree, and I support that the two schools should not continue to be together. We just have to find the appropriate space. And since we don't own any land, we have to work with those who do. And we have always worked with the county council and county executive um, as we look at our plans. So um, hence why we brought forth this presentation with recommendations to consider. Thank you. Mr. Kuhn. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm looking at the, the strategic planning plan. It's like the counts for 21. It has projections and colors and everything in it. And one of my questions is, you're talking about Patapsco High School and an addition being added to that. I don't disagree with that, 
but it looks like Sparrows Point High has a significantly higher need that needs to be addressed. And I feel like we're we're out of priority. Like I, I don't how do we address Sparrows Point immediately? Is my question. And and Mr. Dixit, is it being addressed with the activities that are going on with the county and I guess your team to try and find locations? Or is that work that we need to to to, to direct you to do, or is it already happening? So we are looking for sites. If there is anybody who has suggestions, we will be glad to look at those sites. But Peninsula, as you know, uh, Mr. McMillian is aware of this, uh, it's difficult to find land there. So it is not only one issue in the southeast. What we are saying, what the consultant is recommending, that there are several different issues that have to be handled. So if we can take care of Dundalk, for example, we should proceed with that. If we can take care of Patapsco, we should. Uh, community has made it very clear that the student within the peninsula, they want to remain there. So their issue will be resolved when either we find a site or we use one of our site and combine two schools like he's recommending in one of the options. And our work is continuing in all of that. But we've, tonight's purpose was to share with you what are the recommendations that have been made by the independent consultant. But th there's no go forward here. All, all we hear is we need more study. We don't have space. So uh, I guess my point is how do we help, help to go forward? What do we need to do? We, we have a motion on the floor. And there's been a second. We've had debate. Um, Ms. Causey, is your comment necessary? To, because I'd like to end debate in the interest of time and call the call the vote on uh, this. I have a point of information you, about policy, and um, I, want, I think it's appropriate to clarify a please, statement that was made earlier. Please make it brief. Uh, policy 8120, uh, which is the internal board policy and organization purpose, rule, and responsibilities of the Board of Education. On page three, item, uh, on page three, uh, item 19, the board is empowered by state law to buy or otherwise acquire land, school sites, or buildings, um, rent, repair, improve, and build school buildings or approve contracts for doing so, uh, declare land, school site, or building a surplus. Uh, and when I made my... Um, Motion, it is not precluding uh, work with our county partners. And certainly uh, they are involved, and so it would just be having Mr. McMillian be a part of that yeah. work. So the board is uh, supposed to stay at our level, and then the administration uh, with Dr. Williams and the staff will develop the processes and so forth. So if you're working with the county, uh, then Mr. McMillian will be a part of that. Um, and we can move this forward. That's time, and, and thank you for that reference, Mrs. Causey. I was looking for that myself. That That is well within the purview of the board, and this does, I agree that it needs to be a partnership um, with the county, with staff, and Mr. McMillian's area, or knowledge and expertise can certainly only help the case here. So with that, um, may we have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Stileski? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Ms. Ms. Scott? No. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. Thank you. We have the Northeast area, Mr. Dixon. Yeah. So the Northeast next is community. Northeast area, and we have Mr. Tom Lee from Samaha Associates. So it's your presentation now. Thank you. And I might switch seats with Absolutely. you. Absolutely. I'll, I'll vacate. Thank you for happily. adjusting your schedule a little bit to accommodate. I had a tire blow out on the way here. <laughs> so I appreciate the review. Um, so I'm Tom Lee. I'm a principal with Samaha. We've been working with Baltimore County to uh, study the Northeast area 
in response to the MyI pass um, to look at increasing capacity by 638 seats. And we can advance the slides as we go. Um, so we looked at a few options um, in the Northeast District area, and we included looking at high schools at Kenwood, Lock Raven, Overly, Parkville, and Perry High. Um, and I'll just move on to the next slide. I think we can reach this uh, information through the rest of the process. So in the goals of the study, we're really looking to evaluate all these sites and options and weigh the options, um, including um, what the educational specification be accommodated on which sites, which ones have pluses and minuses for everything from construction to cost to development. Uh, we'll keep moving forward. There were five distinct options that were studied. The first two, option one and two, were building new small 1,000 state rated capacity high schools on new sites in the north um, east planning area. Options three and four were building additions to high schools. Um, the option three was building additions at Perry Hall, Overly, and Kenwood, where option four was limiting the additions to just Lock Raven and Overly. And then the fifth option was building a newer medium capacity high school on the Lock Raven site and replacing the existing school. So to run through those, the first site is the Hiss Avenue site. And you'll notice that um, it's an existing area currently just outside of this neighborhood um, near the 695 and Route 1 area. Um, there's no access to Route 1, and one of the main hurdles here would be, would be directing all the traffic through the local neighborhood on Hiss Avenue. You can notice in red, those are large um, stream buffer setbacks. So while the site is almost 54 acres, it is um, pinned in a little bit by its topography. And the steepness of the slight and the condition of the soils in the site would require fairly extensive um, earthwork and grading as well as retaining walls around the site. However, we are able to fit the full um, educational specifications on this piece of property. It is fairly centrally located, um, so the boundary changes would be minimized by using um, this site in, the, in this area. Although really the access was one of the prime um, negatives on this site. And knowing that there would be a potential outdoor pathway and recreation resource that would be then um, taken over with the new school. So moving to the pros and cons, which is the next slide. I think I've mentioned most of these. Um, and as a thousand student school, it would be one of the smaller high schools. So there would be a slightly higher operating capacity cost to operating a small school as opposed to a medium or larger school. And then it's anticipated that state funding may only be applicable to the need for the 638 seats and not the full 1,000 seat school. And the next site is at the Belmont Park site. We could just have that slide. Um, it's a similar condition, although it's even slightly steeper with more stream buffer setbacks. And you can see to the east, there's a large power easement, so there's no access to the east. But the Walther Boulevard is a better access for the site. However, given the topography, um, we're really not able to accommodate the full high school program. So you'll notice it's short a softball field, it's short some basketball courts, and another play field. And it's really limited to where there would be no opportunity for expansion if needed so in, um, as student uh, capacity needs might grow. So the pros and cons are very similar to this project as the other. It's just an even tighter space. And in this case, the Belmont Park site is previously a, a park, so it would be more of an amenity that would be replaced by the new school. So starting next with option three, I'll mention that we were adding capacity for 638 students, so that's adding classrooms to each of these schools. But a major part of these strategies is also increasing the core areas to accommodate those increase in student capacity. So when we look at adding classrooms, we may have to expand a cafeteria or a gymnasium or even site amenities like parking. And with that, I'll go right to Perry Avenue. It's already um, a state rated capacity of 2,100 students. We'd be looking at adding 10 classrooms to that space. And in doing so, we would need to add additional parking. We need to um, increase the size of the learning commons, the cafeteria, and the gym. 
in many cases, these core expansions um, are greater in cost than some of the classroom additions as part of this work. In all of these, we're only looking at the classroom additions and the core space, but we're not renovating or including the potential cost of renovating the entire school, like the other classrooms or other administrative suites and so on. So the next school is Overly. Similarly, we're adding 13 classrooms and needing to expand the learning commons, the cafeteria, the gym, and the auditorium in this case. And then the third school in this strategy is Kenwood High School. And here we're only adding three classrooms, but the core space needs are greater um, with additions to the learning commons, the kitchen, and the gym um, to accommodate just those three classrooms. And then the fourth option, I can we can skip over this. I think I've mentioned all the advantages and disadvantages. The fourth option is limiting those um, additions to both Lock Raven and Overly. And at the Lock Raven site, this is an existing four-story high school. Um, I can have the next slide. That's largely been unrenovated. We could add a 13 classroom addition. It would require us increasing the size of the cafeteria, the kitchen, and the gym. We do know there's some bad soils on the site, and um, the remainder of the school would be unrenovated in this option beyond the core space. And then at Overly, which was also in option three, here we'd be adding the 13 classrooms and renovating those same core spaces. And the fifth option was really an opportunistic one. We looked at this site of Lock Raven and knowing that there's already a four-story high school there and it's a small 1,049 state-rated capacity school, we found that given the uh, Cromwell Bridge Road and the other site access point, it allowed a strategy where we could potentially build an entirely new high school on the same site and have only the site occupied, but not an occupied phased renovation or addition to a school building, but just rather on the site, we'd be easily able to separate the construction from the student activities. Um, by doing this, we gain the 638 seats, but we are able to retain things like the existing stadium, the existing ball fields, um, we'll have plenty of space to do so. And then at the end of the project, the existing school could be removed. Um, so we're able to accommodate the full EdSpec program this way, um, accommodate future expansion. And then maybe one of the greatest um, benefits here too is that it takes the future renovation needs of Lock Raven um, out of the queue. It's essentially uh, would not be needed to be conducted. And with that, I can go to the advantages and disadvantages here. Um, there still may be a concern that the, the state funding would be limited to the 638, but this does provide the greatest economy of scale for construction because it eliminates that occupied phase building renovation that's apparent in options three and four, but it eliminates the need to build the, the small schools in uh, kind of difficult civil site work settings for options one and two. So we see this as being the opportunity to have the least cost per student um, and solve kind of a few problems with, with one school project. With that, I'll just go to the conclusions. Um, so we did present this through the uh, BCPS website. We had some uh, community meetings um, held digitally that way. Some of the concerns were um, obviously overcrowding that were needed to be addressed through this study. Um, they were concerned that Perry Hall was already a large school and had a preference not to increase it further. Um, there was a general preference that new school construction was beneficial over additions to existing schools where possible. They did have a preference to avoid the larger schools and maybe focus on smaller school capacities where possible for emotional and mental needs of students. And uh, we were asked to you know, consider other um, sites and opportunities through the way. And um, that Lock Raven opportunity was one that we added to the study to accommodate kind of another option um, within this group. So the, ultimately, we're looking at the Lock Raven site as something that already accommodates an existing high school. It's already a four-story high school. Um, so it would not uh, basically take away any green space within the community as we swap the sites of the building. The roadway and support um, for transit is, is strong at the Lock Raven site for accommodating the new school. Um, and we can accommodate the full athletic programs, and it meets all the site requirements. So moving on to the building. Um, so the replacement isn't just 
adding capacity or adding classrooms or increasing the core space. It's providing a completely new school. Um, it'd be compliant with the complete educational specifications for the entire building. And we would intend on replacing the four-story school with another four-story high school um, with a similar limited developmental footprint. The community had noted that they were interested in um, not increasing capacities at the larger schools like Perry Hall or Kenwood. And we believe that this medium-sized school kind of fits the bill of what the community's interests were. At the other small school sites, whether it's either the residential road networks being overloaded or, um, you know, the, the uh, sites being difficult to develop, um, we felt like this new school could provide capacity relief in the future for the central planning area due to its adjacency on the central and northeast area boundary. Um, from a cost standpoint, we really have the greatest longevity by building new construction and we eliminate the need to renovate the existing Lock Raven. I mentioned the medium school being um, potentially better to operate from an operating cost standpoint than the small schools. And um, we find that the lowest cost per student being a cost factor here. So this unique confluence really makes us have a recommendation for option five, the Lock Raven replacement. Um, it's nice when you're able to do a study like this and a lot of factors point to the same decision. Um, it was one that we felt was a, a strong um, solution. So we believe that this is really best for both the site, its readily constructible economy, and what it gives the students and the community in Baltimore County moving forward for the long term. So we recommend this uh, option without hesitation and appreciate any comments or discussion you'd like to have. Thank you for this presentation. Um, a comment and a question, and then I'll turn it over to the board members for discussion. Um, with the recommendation for replacement of Lock Raven, um, are there any concerns that the state would not fund a replacement given the current facility condition of, of Lock Raven over a renovation? And secondly, um, with the location of this versus the location of the needed seats, um, one of the um, pros I noticed of the Belmont Park site is that it's optimally located um, for where the seating is is needed. Um, under boundary, it states minimum impact for boundary changes required to utilize capacity of the new school. And being familiar with it, that area, it is centrally located between Parkville and Perry Hall. It's It, it really is ideal in terms of um, if I were to pick a, a site um, where centrally located to where those seats are needed between our current high schools. So can you yeah. respond? I, I think that that's several exactly questions in one. Sure. I think that's exactly right. And I think that's why the Belmont Park site was studied because of its location. Um, to keep in mind that either the option one or two would still require a boundary change because you're adding a whole new school to the grouping. So there would be students from all the different areas that would be brought into that new space. Um, I do think, unfortunately, that site was just found to be extensively difficult to develop um, given the program. And the main um, reason that we weren't recommending that option was because it was not able to meet the current educational specifications. So there'd be compromises to the students and faculty that would be operating out of that school. Um, it is true that Lock Raven is closer to the central boundary. Um, but it's still within the area of the five schools that we were studying. So we thought that may be an opportunity um, to take advantage of some of those other, um, you know, ability to solve multiple problems with one, with one project. Was that a concern raised by the community? Because it is within the central boundary. And did you look at the impact on, mm -hmm. on students um, in terms of travel? Yeah, in, in our experience, the community really didn't focus on planning areas. They're kind of almost, uh, they're not really present um, in their thinking about it. They're looking at the distances. And all of these schools are still fairly tightly grouped. Um, it's not a very spread out um, area to begin with. So we're talking a matter of a few miles uh, between the schools um, to begin with. So uh, we didn't hear any issues with the community about it being an issue being close to central. Uh, planning district or planning area. The only two me. things I heard from community is new school, no additions. That's the that's the uh, uh, reoccurring conversation we had with community. 
And, and no concerns about the um, use of the, or replacement of the current Lock Raven facility or replacement of that? I mean, architecturally, we looked at replacement? Lock Raven and we saw the school had, hadn't been on, undergone any large renovation efforts. It's a primarily windowless school. It seemed like a real opportunity to deliver something for that community that was um, an improvement and still meet the capacity increase. Did you look at the Lafarge property by chance? No, I don't believe we did. Mr. Dixit, do you know? I don't know where it is. In the White Marsh area? Okay. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Uh, let's see who's next. Mr. Kuhn. Uh, thank you. It's very informative. Um, one of the things that I'm always trying to understand, and I you could, you know, shift boundaries and, and move kids around, but we try and limit that whenever we can. Uh, and and I'm looking at the current and projected utilization in the Northeast planning area, and I see that Overly High School and Parkville High School are the ones that are projected to be at nearly 120% and 130% overutilized um, based on these projections, which is all I have. Um, Lock Raven's underutilized. Kenway's underutilized. Perry Hall's just over 100%. So I think part of your approach of like dropping a school in near Parkville and Overly especially is really meeting a need and it may not be you know, a medium-sized school like you said, but it might be what, exactly what we need, I guess is my point. You're, you're, you're hitting the 683, but you're hitting it with 1,000, right? So there's some room to grow and move things around, and it takes pressure off these schools if, if it's close enough, I guess is my point. So, I mean, I fully understand everything you said with Lock Raven. I mean, it is windowless. It's kind of sad. Um, I wish it had more windows. I just drive by it all the time, to be honest with you. Um, but it is in the center, central area. I know they're, they're kind of close, and there's lots of overlap and feeders. So I, I do see how you ended up here. Um, I'm just wondering if we're going to have a whole, wholesale domino effect of massive shifts of children and students based on increasing Lock Raven that we could avoid by putting a smaller high school in the right location where the population is, is, is really growing. Is that, is that how you targeted the Belmont and Hiss locations? The, the Belmont and Hiss sites were primarily selected for their location originally. Um, but obviously coming up with a property, you know, there's one thing I didn't mention is there's also site acquisition costs or, you know, trading sites with other municipal um, interests in the county. Whereas on options three, four, and five, they're already all school properties and functioning as such. Um, that really the Hiss Avenue site was the traffic getting into that neighborhood, I think, you know, may receive a significant amount of pushback because the road capacity just doesn't seem to be adequate to hold um, a new high school at that location. And then the Belmont Park site, while it had better road access, was um, not able to accommodate the program. So we saw those as somewhat uh, limiting factors for recommending those sites. I think if there was a larger complete site um, in that location, it would, be, it would be great to look at that as well, but we haven't come across any. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Rowe? So I have to say I really like this idea of doing a new school at the Lock Raven High School, and I live in the Hillendale community, and I think they'd like it. And I'm going to say something that no one's going to like, but I'm going to say it anyway. The Hillendale community and this whole, there's a whole section that is zoned to central area, middle and elementary schools. And then those entire communities for high school only are shifted over to the Northeast. And that was mostly done in the 70s or so around when Halstead Academy was built in a subsidized housing community, mainly to make sure that the children in that subsidized housing community would always be walkers to that elementary school. And the school system has always taken that entire elementary school and shifted the entire thing by the whole population 
to any school as far away from Towson as they could possibly get it to be. And I don't think that it's right that so many of these children have their friends attending uh, elementary schools and middle schools in the central area, and then in mass, they're shifted over to Parkville High School. And so, in my mind, you could alleviate some of the overcrowding in the northeast area if you kept the children who are zoned for the central area for middle and elementary school in the central area for high school. And the other thing that I've heard the community say a lot about Lock Raven High School is small high schools are great for some things, but small high schools are not great for things like having enough kids in the school to have a marching band or to have some of these other sports that other schools have because to have a sizable enough um, group to do that, you have to have enough kids in the school to be able to do that. And so I think that um, this is a good plan for more reasons than one. Thank you. Dr. Hager? <clears throat> and then, I'm sorry, Ms. Galassi, did you have your, I'm going off the chat. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I can certainly understand if truly these were the only five options. Um, it's reasonable with the reasons that you gave that um, Lock Raven would be the most viable option. I don't know, I don't have the expertise on the northeast side of the county north of Parkville and Overly, but I would think as you get further away from the city, it might be possible to have more open space um, in terms of looking at other possibilities. So I think Ms. Hen asked about the White Marsh area. So I would also ask about north of Parkville and Overly um, were areas um, in that area looked at because the Lock Raven option is great, but as I look at the schools that are in need, Really, the only one that's within a few miles, I think, is Parkville. Um, Perry Hall, Overly, and Kenwood, you really have to jump on the beltway and go a, a solid ways to get there. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Dr. Hanger. Um, thank you uh, also for this presentation. Um, I was grateful that Mr. Kuhn never brings his books home from the board because we have this handy dandy book here we were looking at with, um, with all of the feeder school information and the numbers and so we were going through it over here. And I did, um, my, I, I had, I paused when you said Lock Raven because it's in the central area and it seemed like a, an odd suggestion and then we mapped it on the Google Maps and did all these things to see kind of the distances. And one thing that stood out to me was that there are so many joint feeder schools um, between Lock Raven and Perry Hall and Parkville for middle schools. And I recall that being one of the MyIPAS recommendations was to stop splitting up middle schools into two different high schools. And so um, just another reason why I think this could be a, a solution that I, I appreciate that you thought outside of the box to, to come up with this. Um, one specific question and one general question. So the proposal says to increase Lock Raven to 1,687 students. Um, looking at this great book here, um, there are many high schools that have 1,900 students in it, in, them, in Baltimore County. So why stop at 1,687? So the existing Lock Raven state rate capacity is 1,049, and we were looking just simply to add the 638 seats that were identified in the capacity study. There would be no you wouldn't have to limit it to that number. You certainly could build a larger high school there if desired, um, and that may be advantageous to do at the time of taking on that capital construction project. I would, yeah, I would think so as well. I, do you agree, Mr. Dixit? Yes. Yeah, the reason we really kept it to the 638 was to make it as much of an apples-to-apples -apples comparison as possible okay. compared to sense. the addition projects, yeah. Great, thank you. And I noticed in the proposal, and, and I think it may have been the case with the other proposal as well, it talks a lot about number of fields and number of things that you could add. Um, we've talked a lot about CTE programs and things like that in high schools. Would these additions and new, um, new buildings have the capacity to offer all the new programming that we're hoping to offer moving forward as well? Is that a consideration or is that just something that's going to happen regardless, Mr. Dixon? So, so that, the answer is yes and yes. Okay, <laughs> we are not at that stage where we can make a definitive statement, 
but all of the new high schools that we are designing, we are preparing at spec based on needs of the program. So more than likely, this will be no different than any other high school. Okay, and just thinking those programs often yeah. takes a lot of space, yes. you know, but yeah. for good reasons. So. Yes. All right, thank you. That may be even more of a reason to look at schools that do have a little bit of breathing room to give you a little flexibility for uh, other programs you may want to include. Mrs. Causey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you for this presentation. Um, I um, really appreciate it, and I also appreciate your um, explanation of it um, in a very quick time frame. Um, that's very helpful for us. In the studies that were done, and I was trying to look through and see, um, were, was there a travel time study done or, or transportation time done with any of these options? We did not go through the process of doing like a tributary study or a travel distance to the areas that are served by different schools. We look generally at the maps to try to um, locate them and, um, and determine it that way. I think that may be the next step when we look at the boundary related issues for each option or, or the selected option. Okay, thank you. Um, and I, I do have to say that I do uh, like a lot of the points that you've made about Lock Raven High School with putting a replacement school um, on the same site. Um, and your, your points about it's the greatest longevity, it's, the, um, it's uh, very cost efficient because if you build the brand new school and then it lasts for 50 years or 40 years rather than renovate something that's very old. And, um, and was there any look at the student populations? We know that uh, in our policy that we try and make sure that schools are reflective of their communities. Um, and we have some very diverse communities. And so was there any look at maintaining diversity uh, as you were um, looking at these solutions? I can't say that we tried to um, determine any of the recommendations based on diversity. We did not say that um, one school versus another based on the makeup of that tributary area of students um, influenced the decision. I will say that we did look at potentially adding value to options that um, had the least amount of boundary changes and thinking that that would keep um, individuals to able to stay closest to the schools they're most accustomed to. Um, but it was not, it was not a study done um, demographically of any other groups. Okay, thank you. And um, in terms of the smaller schools, your point about um, challenges of operating smaller schools, and um, it was mentioned about uh, sports and, and other um, extracurricular activities, and uh, Dr. Hager brought up CTE, uh, but also we know that uh, if you have a larger student population, then there'll be a certain number of students interested in a certain language and then right. those students can that class can be offered or computer science or the higher level advanced placements so in terms of staffing and being able to um, fiscally uh, use your staffing but also provide those uh, additional opportunities for students can be helpful with a medium-sized school yeah so we would, we would agree thank you mr. Mercedes do I have time left make this quick um, so Delaney which is adjacent to Lock Raven which was not included um, and Parkville combined need 700 seats by 2030 um, adjacency matters because of the adequate public facilities ordinance and the rule about adjacent schools so I'm concerned that the recommended solution um, meet does that meet our capacity needs by the time it's built and are we considering adjacent schools that were not included in this study so while it, it may meet the central area needs, are we solving one problem but not solving another? And did you consider the central area corridor needs? We did start by considering the northeast area for those 638 seats, but then we recognized as one of the advantages that the opportunity at Lock Raven may also ease um, potential capacity needs there. So. Um, as one of your members mentioned, you know, you could potentially increase the capacity of Lock Raven greater above the 638 seats 
and relieve some of the central district as an, an added benefit to that option. So we were really focused on the northeast area as the purpose of the study, but we recognize that there's a benefit to the central area uh, potentially by this option. Ms. Joes. Thank you. Thank you for this presentation. And uh, as somebody who's lived in the Perry Hall area, White Marsh area for the past 20 years, I know it's a very crowded and built out area. You know, it's in the past 20 years, it's it's been completely almost built out. So it's really hard to find um, a property to build a large high school. So I, I, I do um, kind of agree with your recommendation. My concern is that thousands of families that are going to be impacted um, by these decisions. And you had two community engagement meetings. Do you know or have at the top of your head the number of people that participated in the in the uh, community engagement forums? I don't know those numbers um, off the top, but since they were virtually and held and recorded and posted to YouTube, I think we could probably try to find out the general level of uh, participation in those. It did seem that the comments were fairly um, typical across the comments we received, that they were similar. There wasn't a lot of opposing viewpoints in those community meetings that we had. Like um, Mr. Dixon had mentioned, the interest for spending capital dollars for new construction was a primary um, interest of the community. Okay, and I do think that this is a good opportunity for the board and the, board and the system to look at uh, boundaries. Boundaries are man-made, they're not set in stone, uh, and our schools are, uh, our population is pretty diverse, some of our schools are not, um, there is still segregation. So I think this is a good opportunity for the system, BCPS, to uh, look at those boundaries and, um, you know, take that into consideration when you um, come up with these recommendations as well. So. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hager. Um, yes, so when we spoke before about the Southeast, uh, we own Patapsco, so we talked about the possibility of seeing that um, renovation being in the next capital budget. We own Lock Ravens property. Does that mean that since this is the main recommendation that we'll see that potentially outlined <coughs> in the next capital budget request? So we were waiting for this discussion, mm -hmm. and once this discussion is over and it appears there is a consensus, then superintendent's team and, and the county executive teams will get together and chart the future course. But this surely helps. Okay. So no action is needed. We're just having the discussion today. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions, board members, comments or discussion? Hearing none, thank you for this presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is the report on suspensions, climate, and culture. For that, I call on Ms. Charlie Green, Dr. Zarchin, and Ms. Lewis. So good evening, board. Um, I must have said this three or four times. Good evening, board chair, vice chair McMillian, and board members. Tonight, we're presenting an update on suspension, climate, and culture. Tonight's presentation include our data and specific actions we're taking to respond to the needs of our school communities. As you can see who's moving forward, we have Ms. Charlie, uh, Ms. Mildred Charlie Green, Chief of Staff, Dr. Michael Zarchin, Chief of Schools, Ms. April Lewis, Executive Director of School Safety and Security, and Dr. Kim Ferguson, Executive Director, uh, Social Emotional Support, and co-lead of the Suspension School Improvement Team. Uh, Dr. Ferguson defended her dissertation on Monday. So the compass, our pathway to excellence, identifies five focus areas of our work. If you can go to the next slide, focus area two, safe and supportive environment is vital. We know that a coordinated response that addresses all aspects of school climate will create the conditions for the remaining focus areas to be adequately addressed. Every day, BCPS educators work collaboratively to ensure that students can learn in a safe and supportive environment. Our goal is to raise the bar, close gaps, and prepare our students for the future. And the Compass, our strategic plan, serves as our guide. So at this time, I turn it over to Ms. Charlie Green. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Williams. 
Our schools are committed to providing a physically and socially emotionally safe environment for all students and staff. Last spring, we presented our comprehensive safety enhancement plan for the 2022-23 school year. This slide, if you can move to the next slide, please, depicts those actions as well as our current status. To date, we have implement, implemented several initiatives focused on the needs of students and staff in order to create an optimal learning environment for teaching and for learning. I'd like to elevate just a couple of items on this slide. For example, I'd like to call your attention to the grant-funded Student Safety Assistance, a program that we piloted last spring, and we are very pleased that we are able to provide student safety assistance in all of our secondary schools. I'd also like to elevate our continued partnership with the School Resource Officer Program. Uh, thanks to our partnership with county government, we were able to add additional school resource officers, and we definitely value that partnership that we have with our SROs. We also spent a great deal of time making sure that there was clear communication of student expectations. One of the things we heard loud and clear from last year's town halls was that it was very important that we were all on the same page when it came to what we expected from students and what the consequences were when perhaps those behavioral expectations went unmet. We trained our staff to make sure that they understood how to respond to student behaviors, and we also made sure that in student class meetings at the start of the school year, students understood what the expectations were as well. We have, since the school year has begun, engaged in consistent review of our school level data, and that information is used by our executive directors to respond to schools and provide support to school teams. And lastly, uh, the work began last year, and we're pleased to see that it is moving forward to reimagine our alternative programs, to open up more seats, and to creatively use our VLP program to, work, to ensure that alternative environments are available for students when the school environment is not the place for them to be. So if we could move to the next slide, please. So I spoke of the work this spring. I'd also like to call your attention to some of the work we did over the summer. Um, we wanted to make sure everyone was on the same page, so we focused on communication and collaboration. Team BCPS worked with stakeholders, school leaders, and union partners to update our guidance for families and students. The Office of Communications created the Back to BCPS campaign to keep Team BCPS informed about our progress and expectations for ensuring a safe and positive learning environment for all. The goal was for everyone, again, to be on the same page. These messages were e reiterated by school teams and class meetings at the start of the school year. We will continue to share information as we, in collaboration with the BCPS community, enhance our resources and responses to school climate throughout the year. Updates to our websites will include school positive behavior plans, resources, and soon-to-be-revealed discipline data on a quarterly basis. Next slide, please. In March, we shared that BCPS schools are open to volunteers and community partners. To date, schools have identified more than 650 partnerships in our communities. We heard some of those partnerships mentioned tonight in some of the public comments. The Office of Family and Community Engagement, along with school leaders, continues to increase the visibility of tool tools and resources to enhance existing partnerships and to build new ones. Community partnerships help to strengthen and transform the learning experience for students. We know that students are more likely to succeed in school when schools, families, and communities work together in partnership to maximize the learning experience. This summer, we were pleased to hold our inaugural partnership fair where stakeholders came together to discuss how they could support students and families. Last week, we welcomed hundreds of families back to school during American Education Week. Families were able to experience firsthand the welcoming and engaging environment we provide for students every day. To our families, we hope that's not your last visit. In fact, we encourage you to support your local school by volunteering, mentoring, or providing in-kind donations. Again, it makes a big difference when our students see parents and community working together and invested in student success. We'll continue with regular and deliberate outreach to bring our community leaders, volunteers, and mentors into the buildings. We value our families and look forward to strong partnership. So at this time, I turn it over to Dr. Ferguson. Thank you, Ms. Charlie Green. Our work to provide preventative supports, restorative learning, and logical consequences are critical to growth and the growth and development of all our students. The resources, supports, and interventions available for BCPS are tiered to address the needs of all students, small groups of students, and individual students. Tier 1 supports are designed for all students and are often preventative 
and proactive in nature. Some examples of tier one supports include lesson planning, relationship and community building, positive behavioral instructional supports, social emotional learning, and trauma-informed practices. Tier two supports address small groups of students and include evidence-based small groups for students, small group counseling, restorative just and restorative justice activities. And tier three supports are based on individual students and include evidence-based interventions for students, progress monitoring, behavioral so support planning, and restorative justice. Across supports and practices, professional learning communities are essential to the academic success and personal development of all, our students. We strive to engage students in positive learning environments while providing a wide range of supports <coughs> to build resili resilience and skills to navigate successes and challenges. Now I'll turn it over to Dr. Zarchin. Thank you. Although suspensions do not provide a, a total picture of a school environment, they do provide a glimpse into behaviors that may impact positive climate. Suspensions provide a temporary separation from the school environment to protect teaching and learning. The Code of Conduct outlines specific behaviors that may lead to suspensions. Principals have full authority to implement the Code of Conduct based on unique circumstances within their schools related to disciplinary infractions. The first marking period suspension rate for BCPS was 2.01%. All grade span suspension rates remain consistent with last year's trends. For this first marking period, the highest rate is in middle school, where it is 4.34% followed by high schools at 2.58% and elementary schools with the lowest rate at 0.46%. System-wide, the suspension rate for all students, as I mentioned, it, period one is 2.01%. The chart shows that student suspension rates by grade level for market period one of the current school year. As displayed, students in kindergarten through grade two have a very low suspension rate. The suspension rate generally increases as students transition from grade three to grade five. The transition year between elementary and middle school represents the greatest increase in student suspension rate, increasing by almost 3.4%. That's by the end of grade six. This increased rate of suspension continues through middle school and grade 9 before gradually decreasing from grade 10 to grade 12. While disciplinary incidents, as evidenced by referrals and incidents, have decreased this year, the suspension rates in some grade levels have increased when compared to marking period 1 last school year. Specifically, Transition year grades six and nine are the most significant increases that we're seeing. Overall, middle schools continue to have an increased suspension rate in comparison to the pre-pandemic rates. Trends in suspension rates show that the transition years from middle school through grade nine have the highest rate of suspension. Ms. Lewis. Thank you, Dr. Zartan. Best practices for creating safe and successful schools include ongoing analyses of student behaviors and efforts to promote a positive school culture. Discipline referrals are entered electronically in focus, including bus referrals. Referrals include information about the reported behavior, location, time, and description. Administrator actions are captured in the system and are available for the referring staff member to see. They become a part of the student record. As part of staff training, certain behaviors are first managed by staff in classrooms, hallways, and on buses. Some of these behaviors include excessive talking or defiance. For the purpose of illustration, it may be helpful to categorize behavioral infractions as discretionary and non-discretionary. 
Discretionary infractions are usually staff member managed behaviors as I have described and as pictured in this slide. In the instance when discretionary behaviors are either repeated or acute, staff may escalate the concern to administrators through the referral process. Once an electronic referral has been submitted, administrators receive an alert and take appropriate action. The consequence is recorded in the system and reported to the referring staff member. Our staff have an interest in accurately reporting behaviors because they understand the importance of a safe learning environment. Non-discretionary behaviors pose imminent threats to physical and or psychological safety and should be immediately referred to administration. In many cases, administrators respond to these behaviors directly and document the behavior and consequence through the referral process. Our staff have an interest in reporting behaviors because they understand how safe, how important it is to have a safe learning environment. The electronic referral ensures mutual accountability for reporting and responding to behaviors. In addition to administrators and school staff, students and families may also report safety violations to administrators directly or to the Maryland Safe Schools hotline. Tips from the Safe Schools hotline are communicated to BCPS and action must be taken. All tips submitted through the Maryland Safe Schools hotline are reviewed by school safety managers. School safety managers contact the principals of the involved schools to make sure the situation is handled and to assist as necessary. Discipline data is analyzed weekly for consistency by executive directors of schools. Not only does this data provide insight excuse me, into student behavior trends, it is also used to determine the need for additional resources, training, and support to students and school teams. Ms. Charlie Green. Thank you. While our efforts indicate progress, we know that it is not enough until every single student feels protected and heard. Upcoming efforts to continue our work include continued direct support to schools and the development of a safe and supportive environments advisory group comprised of BCPS staff and external stakeholders. The goal is to provide transparency on school incidents and BCPS response and to promote continuous improvement through data analysis and multi-stakeholder dialogue. This advisory group is tasked with reviewing data, providing feedback, and making recommendations. Also, our next community conversation on safe and supportive environments will focus on middle schools. Participants will hear from a Maryland Safe Schools expert psychologist on normative adolescent behaviors, and we will discuss opportunities to build positive partnerships and provide student support in middle school. Our data shows that this is an area of intense need. Coming soon, BCPS will debut quarterly, a quarterly school safety snapshot, which is a front-facing data report which, which will provide school-specific positive behavior plans, special programs, resources, and discipline data. Next slide, please. Our continued work. With a student's first approach, we recognize that there is much more work to do. As a school system, we will continue to collaborate across divisions to provide services and supports to schools. We have asked that our schools continue to utilize multiple data points to inform decisions about student consequences and promote social emotional wellness in collaboration with our county and state partners. We also know that our schools are not islands, but are part of larger communities. We believe that ensuring student safety requires parents, guardians, students, and community stepping up and coming together to ensure that our schools are safe places for all. We call on our parents to limit or monitor student, uh, student social media, join with the school community to provide a positive pre presence, and to share safety concerns directly with school leaders and or the Maryland Center for School Safety, who will ensure, as Ms. Lewis described, that issues are resolved and addressed swiftly. Next slide, please. So at this time, we thank you uh, for taking time to hear our presentation. We are available to answer any questions and certainly any comments from the board.
thank you for that presentation. It's incredible. Mrs. Causey, you had a question? Thank you, Madam Chair. And I just, <clears throat> excuse me, got out of that wonderful presentation. Thank you for that. Um, and thank you for all of the work because we know that when um, we students came back in person and adults came back in person that there were uh, a lot of different challenges from, from being apart. Um, I wanted to ask the question about um, the one, w the discretionary versus non-discretionary. And what we're hearing from our um, teachers, TABCO, ESPB, ESPBC, but also um, our parents, is uh, the disruption to uh, the, the learning, the teaching and the learning. So even uh, things like tardiness, which, uh, you know, not necessarily disciplinarian, but again, an interruption to the teacher and their, the flow of their class. Um, disrespect. I don't see that as <laughs> discretionary uh, in terms of somehow being addressed. Um, and I'm just curious because sometimes if uh, behaviors aren't addressed at smaller points in time, they do escalate. So um, having fewer referrals to me is a question. Um, is that something that really should be more considered and even um, in terms of getting more input from the teachers and the educational support professionals about what they're seeing and, and how best to address it to prevent further problems. I can start, Ms. Lewis. So, so thank you for that question, Ms. Causey. I want to just be clear that our referrals have actually increased. So we have not had fewer referrals. In fact, we've, they've increased exponentially. For one reason, we've um, mandated this year that all referrals are put in focus, whereas in previous years, uh, they may have been a combination of practices. Some schools were still using the paper referral process. And so what we found by um, making sure that all schools were trained and that everyone was putting referrals in focus this year, that we're better, better able to document not only the behaviors, but the responses. It also allows us to track the consistency of implementation of the consequences that we put. Um, to your point, certainly there are some levels of classroom behavior that require immediate attention. And so uh, one of the things that Ms. Lewis outlined was if behaviors are repeated or acute, uh, then, then certainly uh, we have empowered school staff to immediately refer that behavior. Part of the training with teachers and part of the pedagogy of being a classroom teacher is how do you manage behaviors that are disruptive while maintaining the order in the classroom and, and maintaining your position as a leader in the classroom. And so we do count on our teachers as professionals to have to use that judgment, but we are there to support them when that behavior is repeated and it is acute, then they certainly may refer that behavior immediately. Ms. Lewis, I don't know if you have anything you'd like to add to that. No, and I think as you were saying, Ms. Causey, starting at the lowest level possible, yes. mm -hmm. that prevention piece is very much tied to instruction, to classical management. Mm -hmm. And so if we can do it at that level, then we're alleviating or addressing these behaviors early on. But again, if they are acute or they continue, then the referral process is there to move them to administrators. Thank you, and I like that consistent process because one of the things we want to find out is why is a student struggling mm -hmm. to dive deep and not just, oh, he had you know, some issue with this teacher on this day and then he had a different issue with a different teacher on that day, but to understand the picture. Mm -hmm. What is that student dealing with? How can, how can some program in the school help? It's time, Dr. Hager. Yes, thank you, and congratulations again on your PhD. Um, I, what, I, I've really enjoyed hearing during public comment about all the partnerships that have been built. I think that's a fantastic effort that I know Dr. Williams has championed and, and a lot of folks around the table have, have really uh, promoted and I think that that's such a wonderful thing. So I just wanted to say that first. Um, second, and um, this is a very basic question, but we talk about suspensions um, and then we're hearing about different you know, non-discretionary act actions like bringing weapons to school. So are, if, is a suspension is the same thing as expulsion these days? Are we defining them all in one, under one bubble, like in-school suspensions, out-of-school suspensions, going to an alternative school, like all those things, are, is that all suspensions? Is that what we're talking about here? They are all suspensions, um, certainly. Yes, they are. So when we are talking about suspensions, we are talking, if I'm not mistaken, this is all out-of-school suspensions. I don't think we're including in-school suspensions in these numbers. 
Um, but there are short-term suspensions, there are longer-term suspensions, and I'll allow Ms. Uh, Ferguson to share the right. distinction between the two. Right. Mm -hmm. So there are suspensions that are between one and three days, then four and ten days, and then you, there are expulsions that are beyond 45 days. So um, it depends upon the offense um, and the violation to the student code of conduct. Good. So all the data we see here is all out so of school out suspensions. Of school suspensions. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. And have you looked at the data disaggregated by discretionary and non-discretionary reasons for suspensions? And has that changed over time? So we do encourage our administrators to look at that. Um, as a matter of fact, um, I was actually looking at that today to look at those discretionary um, behaviors, disrespect, defiance, as opposed to the, the non-discretionary behavior. So we encourage that. That's part of what I think Ms. Charlie Green talked about, the fact that the DOSDDs on a weekly basis, they look at those type of um, suspensions and what are students being suspended for. And at the same time, when you when this referral is made, where is that referral? Where is it taking place? Is it in the cafeteria? Is it in the classroom? Is it in the hallway? Um, so we would encourage our administrators to not only look at the actual, the behavior, but where is it occurring? Because sometimes you find that things are happening in the cafeteria, but they're not happening in the classroom, or they're happening in the hallway or in the restrooms. So um, that requires us to look at what do we have in place as far as tier one interventions? How are we using our safety, safety assistance, for example? Are they in the hallway flowing with traffic? So we, we um, encourage our administrators to actually dive deep into the, not only the cause of the behavior, not the cause, but the actual behavior that they're being referred to for and then where that is occurring. Because that's the only way we're going to try to remediate some of the, some of the things that we're seeing. We got to really analyze that data mm -hmm. to see what's happening in, in the classrooms and in the hallways. So that's the administrator's responsibility, though. Administrate and the school climate team. So with okay. the support of their um, their their e executive directors, as well as the support of my office. So we support our um, our administrators in looking at that data as well. Okay, great. And you mentioned uh, you can use the VLP for suspensions. We have. Um, the, the last number I heard, we have roughly 300 slots in the VLP for students for, you know, where, who needed another placement based on behavioral infractions. Is that because they, the alternative schools don't have seats or is they would normally, it's just a three-day suspension and they don't so, fall so behind? In, in, in some cases, it's, it's complicated and they're unique circumstances. So I don't know that I could come up with a general overall reason, but there are for some that, you know, transferring to an alternative program is not appropriate, uh, but removal from the school environment uh, is, and so we're able to, to utilize that program in that way. And we do appreciate the flexibility of the VLP, and we are also able to guarantee that students are receiving you know, high-quality instruction during the time period that they're separated away from the school. So we're pleased that we're able to make And if they're in the VLP, do they get the wraparound services they would get in an alternative school? Yes, we do have counselors and um, people personnel workers assigned to the VLP as well as school psychologists. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Hall? Thank you. So first of all, thank you. Thank you all for, for your hard work in school safety and climate. I know personally, as someone who is in a school building day in, day out, I do see the positive impacts of that, um, especially mentioning the student safety assistance. I know Perry Hall High School is one of the first schools to receive that, um, and they are working. So thank you for that. We are seeing positive improvements, and I think that is so essential to note. Um, just sort of sharing some of the student perspective with all of you. Um, so I have had the opportunity to visit, I believe, three middle schools thus far. Um, and I always um, I always walk into middle schools asking and high schools as well, asking what is your favorite and least favorite part of your school? Um, and every single time I walk into a middle school, the least favorite part is always the violence. And so I asked a middle schooler, um, thinking, you know, they're going to respond with in the best manner they can. I asked a middle, middle schooler, why do you think students um, get into physical fights, physical encounters? Why do you think violence happens? And she responded with the most intelligent thing ever. And I told her, you should take my job one day. Um, and I told her that, and she told me that 
um, she thinks the reason people get into fights are because they don't know how to communicate their feelings and that their feelings are too big for them. So I think that's important to to talk about when we talk about middle school suspension rates, which are significantly higher than high school and elementary school suspension rates. We're also realizing that these people are growing into a space that they are not yet fully equipped for. And that is something that is outside of their control. But it is, it is also something that we can mitigate. Um, and it is something that I do see you guys actively mitigating. And I appreciate you for that. Um, I appreciate the work with the Maryland Center for School Safety. Um, huge shout out to them. Um, but I think it is important that we are consistently discussing the impact of mental health and, and restorative justice because it is addressing it from the root. We cannot learn in our schools if our schools are not safe. Scott? Yes, hi, thank you for that, for the presentation. Um, I had a question about the discretionary ones where it says like disrespect, defiance. Um, that's discretionary, is, is, it's up to the discretion of the teacher. And I think what you all were talking about before where it happens, is it explained to the student, I'm assuming in like the, like the student handbook or something at the beginning, what is considered to be disrespectful or defiant um, because it could be sometimes a, a disconnect there. Mm -hmm. How is that handled? So at the beginning of the school year, all of our schools are provided with a, all of our students are provided with um, lessons related to the student code of conduct. So um, this is an opportunity for the student and the teacher to go over the student code of conduct and and go talk through some of these um, these discretionary and non-discretionary behaviors. So what does that look like? Um, and we talked about the fact that every school does have a school-wide positive behavior plan. That plan is school-wide, but then it's also in the classroom. So when you talk about what's happening in the classroom, we the, the teachers set up rules for a bat, lack of a better word. So when we talk about we respect one another, what does that look like? What does that sound like in this classroom, in the hallway, in the cafeteria? So that's part of um, examining those school-wide positive behavior expectations. expectations. And that's, that's one of the things that we did this summer um, when we met with our administrators. We talked about level setting. We talked about what what does student behave, what should we be expecting from students in the classroom, in the hallway, what does that look like? And then that, that in turn ended up in our lessons related to the student code of conduct. Um, so that happens at the beginning of the school year and it should be reinforced throughout the school year. Okay, and um, what happens then if a student is suspended or expelled for something that is discretionary, like talking? where it might have been asking a lot of questions, but it was perceived as talking and the student was suspended. What do you do when you come across students who have been, um, I guess, sort of maybe overly, expend overly suspended or expelled? So once again, you want, did you want to start? I, I can start. Then. Okay. So, so to be clear, our suspensions really we don't we don't see that very frequently. We do look at the data uh, weekly. A teacher can refer. Um, let's say that that's a teacher managed behavior, and it doesn't have to be a teacher. It could be any other staff member. There is behavior that is disruptive to the classroom, and they have repeatedly spoken to the student, and they may need some administrative support. It would be highly unlikely that a student would receive a suspension for that behavior. There could be additional interventions that take place uh, in order to support that student but a suspension would be highly unlikely. If we see, as we are looking at that data, and to be clear, that's work that is done by the executive directors in support of schools, that's work that's done by the administrators, but it's also done at the cabinet level where we look at that, and it will be also work that's done as part of the advisory group that we are very much looking forward to creating, where we're looking at where are people suspending. And if we're seeing suspensions for things that frankly perhaps could have been managed earlier, what additional support does that school need so that they're able to better manage those behaviors before they become um, behaviors that perhaps do require suspension. So we really are looking at that earliest point of contact and what we can do differently so that they don't rise to the level of suspension. Okay. Um, we can provide you better data after the advisory group meets about what that breakdown is, but when we look at our suspensions, they really are for the more um, 
you know, the, I, I don't want to use the word intense, but <laughs> but but certainly yeah. not the behavior you describe. Definitely. Yeah, I appreciate that. And the data would be good for that. And then just my last question is when a student is suspended or expelled outside of the school, what support? are they getting when are they just suspended um for several days or, or or like you all had said a longer period of time and they're not getting any support they're just sitting at home or are we still providing some sort of support to that student we, we are still required to um give students education once they're out um, well not just education but like support as right, far as so, what caused the infraction right so um if a student is suspended outside of school, especially for a long period of time, they usually are referred to the student conduct hearing officer. And that person is a point of conduct with the, a point of contact with the student and with the family. So there are things that once, if that student needs to be working on certain behaviors, um, especially depending upon if the student is, let's say if the student is suspended for drugs, um, we do recommend that the student get engaged in um, some type of rehab and before the student comes back to school, it's not mandatory that they do so, but we do make recommendations. And every time a student is suspended, that the parents receive a list of community resources um, so that they know there are things that they can do on the outside. We don't lose touch with kids once they get suspended. That's not, that's not what happens. You don't go home and then we just forget about you for a while. There's, con there's contact with that student to make sure that they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. They're completing their assignments, that they're on track, especially if they're in high school. We want them to earn their credits um, so we don't lose touch with kids because they still belong to us. Um, and we still want to, we want to make sure that we restore them back into the environment once they've, um, you know, they've completed their uh, consequence, whatever that is, whether it's five days, 10 days, 45 days, but we don't lose touch with kids. That's, it's part of our job to stay in touch with them and make sure that we bring them back into, um, into the building and make sure that they get their education, they finish things out. Okay, thank yeah. you. Thank you, Ms. Joes. Thank you, thank you for this presentation. Uh, many of my questions were asked, but I'm gonna um, repeat that. You said about discretionary infractions, tardiness, somebody skipping school or being disrespectful. Does that warrant a 10 day suspension? I would say no. And behavior. <laughs> pardon me. I would, I would say on its face, no. Um, but we do know that um, there are unique circumstances, so I would certainly invite uh, Dr. Zarjan and his work with schools to talk about the decision making that occurs around the suspension. I will share that we, um, while we definitely empower our school leaders to be able to make decisions that best support the, their school needs, we also invite them to take part in what we loosely call a huddle, you know, not making decisions alone if they are grappling with a decision about what appropriate uh, consequences are to connect with their executive director, to have that conversation, to look at what other students who've engaged in similar behavior, what the consequences have been, so that we are holding ourselves accountable for making decisions that are sound and that are grounded in what our best practices and what our regular practices are. I'll allow you to expand if you would like. Absolutely. So no, we wouldn't have a 10 day suspension yes, for definitely. somebody <laughs> cutting school. In fact, we want them in school. Absolutely. We, as, as mentioned earlier, and I think this is really important, our executive directors review suspensions. They're reviewing bus referrals. We want to make sure first that these red flags of behavior can be addressed. Ideally, tier one supports, it's done for everyone. If con continued behavior is evident, then we've got to do some different things. When it involves safety, we're going to move to a suspension. We know we cannot tolerate safety infractions. So there's no leverage there um, with, with physical altercations. We've got to address it. We know that. We review the data. We want to make sure that the supports there, not just for the students, but for the schools, staff members in schools, to make sure they're equipped with classroom management to keep order in the classroom. Hallway supervision. If something's happening in a certain se section of the building, that we can address that and, and kind of have staff members there to, to, to monitor. So it's an opportunity to learn and examine and give feedback to school principals that they can share with their staff. So 
we talk a lot about suspensions, but it's, it's referrals as well, so we can learn and be better equipped to, to help students, but also address climate in the building, so it's a safe climate. So all that sounds really good in paper, but I've heard a lot of um, instances of where students have been suspended um, where I live for discretionary behavior, and, and this is something that has been shared with me. So talking in, in paper is one thing, what's really happening in, in the schoolhouse when you have a school demographic with um, an African-American population of just 25%, but 90% of that population is suspended. And those are not raising red flags down in central office. I have concerns with that. And, um, you know, yes, we have strategy, we have schoolhouse support, but where is the action and who is really diving into this every day? Is this something you're looking at every day, every suspension that comes on your desk? Um, are you going in there to talk to these children? And um, I'm glad that they're getting wraparound services, but is there follow-up? Who is keeping uh, tabs on this on a daily basis? Because these are the children that we are failing, that are falling between the cracks. And I'm not talking about violence, or those are. I'm talking about the, in, you know, the discretionary um, infractions that happens that teachers get irritated because of biases or get annoyed or, um, you know, and, and it, it does come in, biases do play into it. We know that it's a fact. I'm not stating rocket science here. Um, what are you doing about that? I'm not talking again, do not conflate that with non-discretionary. That, that is serious and I don't, uh, I'm not talking about those, I'm talking about the discretionary. And uh, I would, after this thing, circle back with, with staff, not in open session, uh, about some of the stories that I've heard. So I really want to see what are you doing? Are you looking at this data every day and who is doing it? Who is, is it coming up to Dr. Williams' level or is it just staying at a cabinet level? Thank you. So I, I can't tell you that we don't have decisions that are made that are based on bias. That's why we review the data each week. And I think it would be helpful for Mr. Mustafer to come up and talk about those weekly reviews. But again, it's learning not just for the students, but for the adults so we can make good decisions. The last thing we want to do is have a student out of school. Um, but when we review the data, if, if things come up that are concerning, we do address them from the ED to the principal right down to other staff members. So let me d respond, Dr. Zarchin, before Mr. Muster first. So Ms. Jose, yes, absolutely. That's why we created the system improvement team. Great. That's one of the goals, to look at what's really happening. But I have to say, our principals are looking at this data. And if they're looking at the data and they're making some decisions and supporting the teacher and there seems to be a disconnect, our executive directors are, are going to have those conversations. And I must say to the board, you hear things out in the community and that, that sometimes it's not the entire picture or there's multiple infractions that have happened. So, so your particular case, we're happy to discuss offline if you have some specific information. But again, this is the work of your school principals every day. Their job is to make sure their, the school has a working environment, a, a positive learning environment. Are we there 100% every day? No, because we've seen examples right here in this boardroom. So, so the point is that this is, we can't have learning if there's not a safe environment. We can't have safe environment and expect everyone to learn. And remember, our students are coming back from a very traumatic experience of being online. And so our teachers had to adjust, our, our students have to adjust. So to answer your question, that is why we created a system improvement team to look at this very particular area um, around suspension, what's happening across the system. There is discretionary, but the principals as professionals are working with our staff to determine whether this is suspendable or not. There may be something else, but if there is a specific case, we'll be happy to discuss that later. But I will say, just today, I've watched our principals, our high school principals, talked about teaching and learning and providing a work, a positive work experience and sharing relevant practices. That's the whole concept of the system improvement team. And Mr. Mustafer, Ms. Jose, 
Joseph, in terms of their executive director of the high schools, all the executive directors look at this data every week, disaggregate it, have the conversations, and are questioning, particularly, are, the, are we meeting the needs of students? I'm going to go back to what Dr. Zarchin said. We're looking for the root cause. Something is causing these behaviors to happen. What can we do with the collaboration of the parent and the experts at the school to, to make that support? But Mr. Mustafer, would you share just a little bit about what happens every week at the executive director level? Yes, sir. Thank you, uh, Dr. Williams. And Dr. Williams put it, put it so eloquently. Um, he said a lot of what I was going to say. But um, as Dr. Jarton talked about, we look at not only uh, bus referral data, we also look at um, referrals written by our teachers. And we look at that data and it's disaggregated. So we know it's disaggregated by race, by grade level, we look at areas of the county, we look at time of day incidents happen, and one thing that we want to ensure is that every referral written by a teacher, that there is an action by the administrators so that one, the teachers feel supported, and also we do the same thing for bus referrals so that our bus drivers and our bus attendants feel uh, supported. So that's something that we do each week, all 10 of the executive directors. And when we're talking about discretionary versus non-discretionary -disc things, um, if a student is talking for the first time out of turn in, in or in a disrespectful manner, of course we wouldn't want one of our administrators uh, to suspend the student for 10 days. Um, you have to look at repeated actions when you're looking at non-discretionary things. We're in the service industry. Kids, are. we know that all of our students, their, their brains aren't developed fully, so they're going to make mistakes. So when we say non-discretionary, it, it's the, the teachers have the discretion, and if the teachers decide to write a referral, then they're turning over that responsibility of the action to the administrator, and then the administrators have the discretion on what those consequences or disciplinary actions uh, will be. So it's important for, as Dr. Williams said, the principals must work with their teams to look at the data. What, what is happening? Is it around the department? Is it your first year teachers? Is your your experienced teachers? Is your your teachers who are at the end of their careers and are feeling burnt out and what could we do to support them? So that's why you're looking at the data to see how can you support the students, but also how can you support um, the staff? And we know we have to work with our administrators. So we, we're reviewing this data each and every week. Ms. Uh, Dr. Ferguson, now uh, um, uh, Dr. Ferguson and I are uh, co-chairs of the uh, SIT suspension team that Dr. Williams talked about. And so within our group, we're also looking at the data district-wide. We're looking at trends and patterns. We're looking at best practices. We brought in some principals and their teams to have conversations with us. One principal that I can identify uh, is April Franklin at Southwest Academy because her and her team were doing some wonderful things, not only with their overall suspension rate, but with also when we were looking at disaggregating the data and disproportionality, they were also doing very good work uh, there as well. So we're looking at not only schools where maybe the suspension rate or the referrals are high, but we're also looking at schools where they are low um, in, in the surrounding schools they're high to see what that principal and their teams are doing in order to better support and, and work uh, with, with the school. So I just wanted to share that in addition to what the rest of my colleagues and Dr. Williams uh, previously stated. Ms. Tuleski? Thank you for the presentation. Congratulations to you. Um, first of all, um, I think that we have to honor that um, there have been significant improvements this year in terms of school climate and culture and discipline compared to last year. Um, I applaud some of the new initiatives that you've created, the middle school, um, safe and supportive environments, town hall, the advisory group as well. Um, the partnerships seem to be increasing, and I loved um, the story of Ms. Fisher when she talked about the mentorship with the concept of purpose and how students have to have purpose, and there's so many little teachable moments that 
are going to continue to come about with the mentorships. So I have a couple questions. I'll take them one at a time. So the first one, with um, like the students that do the chronic talking, and I firmly believe teachers have to have autonomy in their own classroom to manage and to gain the respect of their students. Um, but I also appreciate that when there is chronic talking, and I've heard a lot about this from community members, that the majority of the students are there to learn. And um, you know, of course, it's not fair to them when 30 minutes and a 50 minute class are spent with the teacher playing you know, whack-a-mole or whatever with classroom disruption. So how is that balanced so that um, the discretionary um, issue of talking, which can be disruptive, is managed in a way so that it's guaranteed that for the other students in the class, they have their right to learn. So how that's handled um, multiple ways. One is professional development uh, for uh, the teachers, because you, you have to think about that in a manner. And each of you uh, would handle kids differently. Some classrooms you go in, there's a lot of talking, a lot of actions. That's what the teachers want. Some classes you go in, some teachers are more strict um, more structured around what they want kids to be doing and, and discussing. So you have to look at that uh, as well. But when you're talking about a, a student who may be having some disciplinary issues and once it becomes constant and the teachers are, are having difficulty with that kid, then that's when you want to look at other resources in order to provide support. Um, is this uh, teacher utilizing the school counselor? Has the teacher called home? Is this, uh, stu does the student need to be referred to the uh, student support team to provide additional support? Does the student already have an IEP and then those the IEP uh, services that are on uh, the document have to be implemented in a different way? So so each case is, is very different because the teachers are different and the students are different. But, but no teacher, and Dr. Williams stated this to the high school principals today, we, um, that he doesn't want any student to be disruptive in any classroom or any school to where it's negatively impacting uh, other students in classrooms or in the school in its entirety. So the principals understand that, but we all know why we got into this business and we know that we're going to deal with kids that will cause some disruptions and it's how we react to them that will help the students to change their behaviors. There may be 1% of students that we just do not get through after trying every strategy that we can, every support that we can, every uh, adult in that building working with that student. And then we have to look at other resources and options. And, and I know uh, Dr. Ferguson has already uh, brought up um, the VLP program. So sometimes we have to remove a student from brick and mortar and put them in the virtual environment for the betterment of themselves and the rest of the students and adults uh, in the school. And so that's what uh, we have been doing. That's what we'll continue to do. And we're making the VLP program more robust to provide those wraparound services, as you all previously uh, discussed. So I want to just give kudos to Dr. Elmendorf uh, and his team, because we're trying to make sure that the VLP program is equivalent to a, a, a brick and mortar uh, elementary, middle, and high school, so that all those services are there. You just don't have the four walls. Thank you. Um, second, I want to honor what Ms. Hassan said about her interview with the student who stated that the reason why there's so much aggression is that students don't know how to channel their, um, their emotions and their uh, social skills. And I know that there is that SEL program. And I have heard just talking with teachers and, and even some parents, that many students don't find it meaningful. So I was going to just suggest that if you guys could create some kind of survey or, or some kind of tool to, to gain some feedback on it, because it has a lot of promise as well, of um, you know, what's going right with the SEL program, but what the students really want and need from it. One of the things that I've heard specifically is that the groups are so large and the students feel so disconnected to the students that are in their groups that it's very hard for them to be honest and to be open. Um, 
my, my next question, um, again, giving teachers autonomy. Thank you. Thank you. I, I just want to comment that the teachers, they are the leader of those classrooms. They're going to make sure they have teaching and learning. And if they, the last thing they want to do is usurp their authority to someone else. They're going to use every, remember, every, all of us who've been teachers, you, we had to go through classroom management. We had to do student teaching. We had to provide that feedback. So the teachers are going to own their students. I've watched it. They're going to own their students and really support. But there are times where they've done everything, Mr. Lusky, that they could possibly do, and they have to then turn to that assistant principal, that counselor. Most of them will, will go to their counselor and say, like, you know, I'm struggling with little Daryl. He is talking nonstop in my classroom. He can't keep still. Ah, that's a signal. Something might be going on with little Daryl. It might not just be he's being de defiant. There's something else. So that's where we start talking. We work with the parents. What's going on? The, the teachers here, the last thing they want to do is kind of turn something over that's non-discretionary to an administrator. However, there are times where behaviors continue, and they're going to need that support. We have counselors. We have social workers. We have psychologists. We have our administrators. Um, and that's where it gets into that referral when the teacher said, you know, I had enough. I need some support. But they're going to do just about anything to try to resolve the problem in the classroom. And then I have to tell you this. There are other students who may step up as well to say to little Daryl, I'm tired of you talking. You know, I'm trying to learn. I've seen that in the elementary school where folks can self-advocate. So I just want to remind our staff are trained professionals. They had to be certified. They go through training. The last thing they want to do is kind of turn something over. But we do know that there are times where they're going to need that additional support. And the additional support happens in that building, exists in that building. And the more important part is when we have to collaborate as a group, our student support team at the building with our parents to say, what's really happening with little Daryl? And little Daryl, if you're watching, I'm not referring to you, my son, because he always gets mad when I do that. <laughs> Thank you. Ms. Rowe. Um, so the first question is, so it's not about like what parents can see about other students, but like, so if, if my kid gets a referral, can I see that in focus? So when I log in and look at my kid's stuff, can I see if my kid did something that got a referral and maybe I didn't get a phone call or I didn't know about it? Um, but like as a parent, can I see the discipline referrals for my own children in focus? No, um, the, the easy answer is no. Parents can't see referrals. Um, the way parents are communicated with is either by the teacher. Uh, usually, administrators always tell teachers if, if students do something, especially the non-discretionary, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the discretionary conflicts or whatever the situation is, we always want them to communicate with the parent first. That's the first thing that they need to do prior to writing a referral because you want the information coming directly from the teacher to the parent so that there is no middleman. That allows the parents to ask questions, that allows the teachers to give a, a very robust explanation of exactly uh, what took place, but more importantly, it allows the teacher and the parent to build a quality re relationship. So that's the biggest piece. But the answer to your question is no, parents cannot see uh, referrals. Okay, my other question is, um, I've been hearing a lot about problems caused by cell phones in schools, and the board has a cell phone policy, and so I'm wondering why there seems to be variability in how the cell phone policy is being applied one school to the next. With, with regards to that, um, it, the board does have a cell phone policy. Um, Dr. Williams talked about this a lot. Uh, we, that's where we need strong support from uh, the parents. Um, 
and some schools get it better than, than other schools. There is a, a middle school under Dr. Minus's uh, watch right now. They've been doing some work with the cell phones. The parents have been so cooperative, and we're seeing an improvement in not only grades, but also overall grade point averages uh, in that school. But there are some um, situations, some communities where the parental involvement is um, it, very, very good, and there's some where the principals are working hard to increase uh, parental involvement. But in, in, in some instances, and I, I just have to say this, kids, kids' behavior marry, um, mirror the behavior of their parents. Um, so, so we've been seeing an increase in overall negative uh, parental behavior in, in some instances. Uh, so, and we discussed that not only uh, with uh, Dr. Zarchin, but we've also discussed that with uh, Dr. Yarborough in our weekly uh, meetings with her. So we're working uh, through that to see what we could do better as a school system in order to increase that parental support uh, around that. Because again, you don't want to start just throwing out suspensions, putting kids out of school over over cell phones but it it is a there is a negative impact with the increase in, uh, in cell phone over the last uh, decade uh, or so but some schools are doing it a lot better than others because of the parental support so that's something that we'll continue to work at to ensure that uh, all of the schools implement implement the policy as robustly as expected and that's an area this summer we really focused on because we wanted to make sure that students understood what the policy was. So we've encouraged and really pushed principals to discuss that at, at the student level and the teacher level so they know that what's happening in one class is being supported in another. I think that's an area we have seen strides with this year. There's work to be done. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like what we need is to be communicating more with parents communication with parents but it's also communicating from from in within the schools as well so students know what's expected teachers know what's expected and that has been an area of focus mm -hmm. in our work with TABCO to make sure that that, that information is being shared students teachers and mm -hmm. family members so the reason I bring that up is because there's been enough indications and in research and different things is that when sometimes when these fights break out in schools the things that teachers would have seen like back in our day when we passed notes or got into an argument are happening in text message and they're happening on the phone. So the school staff doesn't see the triggers before they happen. All of a sudden two kids just get up and start pounding on each other. Well, what, how do you get from sitting in chairs to, and it's happening on the cell phones. So it seems to me that implementing that cell phone policy could reduce the violence a lot. I, well, it's also I, social media, Miss yes. Miss Rowe. So well, it's it's cell it's cell phone, social media, blogs, things that are happening that are happening one place and it trickles to another location. Um, so it's all of that. It's all about implementation and communication. To answer your question, okay. implementation and communication. Thank you. Thank you. And to follow up on Miss Rowe's question, and Mr. Mustafer, you may have answered this partially. Is what I'm hearing is that entire schools or teachers at entire schools are being told, don't put those referrals in at that first contact. Don't write those referrals. Don't enter them in focus versus contact the parent first. Your first step is to contact the parent. I had not heard that until you just said that right now as, as a first step instead. It sounds like that is what we are advising teachers to do instead no, of putting the referrals in, in, in conjunction so in. When, when a when a teacher writes a referral or when the teacher is dealing with the disciplinary issue themselves you want them to contact the parents to prevent repeated things uh, from happening so there should be communication if there if there's a fight in a classroom for instance that, that's your referral. That's going right to the administrator. The administrator is dealing with it. But it, but if you're having uh, issues with students in classes um, that we would call minor infractions, w the teacher should be the, the person that communicates with the parent, even if they then follow that up uh, with a referral. Because the, the students that do the best 
have the teachers and the parents who have a quality relationship. And so we need the teachers to develop those uh, relationships with the parents. But, but we also need the teachers to develop those relationships with the kids. But there will be some actions that, that students will get involved in that the referrals have to go right to the administrators and, and, and we do not expect the teachers uh, to be in contact with the parents, like, uh, like fightings, like a weapon, um, like contraband. So there are certain things that have to go right to uh, the administrators. So how do we know if the referrals aren't being entered when those minor infractions have added up and let's say they become chronic and little Daryl's running wild and, and in, in every class on the now, yes, in Ms. Tulusky and Ms. Causey's class and Ms. Rowe's class, those, those are repeated and he's a disruption now to the entire third grade and he's, you know, it's become a bigger issue. Mm -hmm. and, and, and if it's not being entered, how is yeah. that? Yes, ma'am. And, and, and Mr. Mustard, you can certainly add, but I wanted to just bring everyone's attention back to Ms. Lewis's remarks when she talked about the referral process and that we certainly encourage teachers to engage in teacher-managed behaviors and strategies to address you know, whatever happens in a classroom that may be minor. Again, that is a student who is talking, perhaps the first time, you try to correct that student, you reach out to the parent, you know, you say this child is speaking in class out of turn, is disrupting the other students, that is low level, that is something you can address. But what Ms. I heard Ms. Lewis say, and I want to repeat just for the good of the group, is that if that behavior is repeated or it is acute, and so I want to just share that distinction. If it's chronic, and it continues to disrupt, and it's having a negative effect on the, uh, on the classroom environment, we certainly encourage teachers to write that referral. If it is acute, meaning that this is something that is demonstrably disruptive that happened all at once, there's no need to go through that. You immediately refer to you refer that to the uh, to the administration. So I want to make that distinction because we hear stories, and and what I hear you saying is whole schools are being told not to write a referral. When I believe what I hear Mr. Mustafer saying, what I know that I heard Miss Lewis say is that teachers, because it is discretionary, teachers are asked to intervene if it is minor, and to address it first if it is repeated to refer, and if it is acute, and that is their professional judgment, which we respect greatly, then they may refer. And so I think we just need to continue to communicate that, because there is no bar on a teacher referring, but I do think there is an expectation that teachers will manage their classrooms for some of these low-level behaviors. And I will tell you that teachers are indeed referring, because we have seen <laughs> ballooning referrals. I mean, I can, as one who reviews them weekly, we certainly have a great number of referrals but we do expect teachers to manage low-level behaviors first and to use their professional judgment if it is repeated or if it is acute. And we can certainly have conversations, if need be, if teachers are being directed regardless of that to not refer, then I do think that's a place where we need to intervene and specific information about those schools and instances. I know that the executive directors would not hesitate to go in and correct that. Um, Mr. Mustafa, I don't know if you have anything that you'd like to add. Everything you said was wonderful. Thank you. And I would ask that we look at both ends of the spectrum, mm -hmm. those that aren't referring as well as those that are referring Absolutely. everything. Because that would be a red flag in either direction, right? That something is a mess. So I will just share, thank you for that, Ms. Hannon, and I will just share that the referral data is for, you know, and, and I'm, I'm very excited for the system improvement team as well as the advisory group to look at this because it really does tell a story. And I think that complete data set where we're saying that any behavioral infractions need to be entered into focus, we can look to see what are, what's happening in the classroom. How many instances of this type of behavior are we seeing? How is that different by grade level? How is that different by time of day? How is that different by subject matter? I mean, all of this paints a picture of what's happening in a school building and allows a school leader and school teams to be able to address that. Does that mean in terms of our you know, schedule we need to do something different? Does that mean in terms of our deployment of our safety assistance we need to do something different? These are all good questions that the data prompts us to ask. And so we're excited about being able to explore that. Uh, certainly to your point, on that opposite end, if we're seeing a great deal of referrals around what may be low level behaviors, perhaps that signals a need for additional professional development. If we're seeing a lack of referrals, but we know that the behavior is problematic, then perhaps we need to you know, look at whether or not teachers are reticent 
to, to put those referrals in. But that is, that is exactly the conversation I hear when I sit down on those conversations with executive directors and what I'm hoping to hear, we invite some of our uh, multi-stakeholder groups to come together as part of the advisory uh, so that we can address those together. Thank you. And it's great to hear that we have supports. You know, it's it's wonderful to encourage that classroom management and to mm -hmm. provide our teachers with those supports to handle it on their own. But when they can't, absolutely, they absolutely need those supports. And we can't position it to be punitive, to say, you know what, it's okay to ask for help. It's, you know, if you need the help, you're going to get it. We're not going to punish you for asking for it, and we're going to make it available. Mm -hmm. And we're not going to make you jump through 500 hoops to get it. Um, I've talked to counselors that have said, little Daryl needs an alternative placement. And I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I'm not picking on you control. or your son. <laughs> I, I promise. That was too tempting. Um, but, you know, we, and we have to do it when, when they need it. So I just want to remind you. the board, <laughs> this is the work that happens in every school. When we get a data point, you all are simulating the conversations at every school to try to figure out how we can support the staff, how we can support the teacher, how we involve the, the, the family. These are the conversations. Are there outliers? Are we seeing a low level, not enough referrals? Are we seeing too many? Are we seeing a particular behavior? That is what, I love it when you all do this. I said this before, you're simulating the work that we do at the cabinet level. You're simulating the work that happens in every school. This is what our principals and their support teams do to try to figure out how to provide that positive learning environment. They too look at the data, they have those conversations. So once again, uh, you know, we can be here for hours looking at this, but, th but, but I just want to reference, I can't not say this is the work of the schools. It's about teaching and learning, but they also spend the time about looking at that climate and culture to make sure everyone is, is safe and secure and when they're not believe you me they are asking the tough questions they're asking the questions of Dr. Zarchin and his team we're looking at the data and we're problem solving and we have some good next steps to really have our stakeholders involved to look at just what you're what you're referring to the support is there if it's not it's not being Again, I think all staff members, again, they have to be certified. There's certain things they have to take. But if there's not there, they're not having those, those strategies, they got a lot of support. Sometimes the reluctance may be not wanting to share that I think I might not be doing something successful in my classroom. And again, we're putting those supports in place to really address that. So thank you, Ms. Hand. Thank you. Mr. Kuhn? It's getting late, so I'm going to be very short and to the point. Um, this has been fantastic information. Uh, I, I really appreciate it. The, the aggressive behaviors, there's been a lot of, there's been a lot of media, social media, fights, Baltimore County, uh, all over the place. You know, that's the impression. But my question is, you're looking at the data every day, are you seeing trends of this is it growing is it going in the wrong direction is is this is it true are there more and more fights across uh various schools or in specific schools are, are, are we seeing this or what what is the real experience so to, to answer your question um it, it it varies honestly uh it, that that is the honest answer we we can have um, a school where they, it can, a month can go by and there are no issues. Then all of a sudden, one week happens and you can have multiple incidents uh, uh, during during that week. Um, so we're we're monitoring the data closely, um, as Ms. Charlie Green discussed. We know the referrals. There is an uptick in referrals. Two things that we know for sure: there's an uptick in referrals. There's been an uptick in the behaviors of of parents uh, that we've had to deal with um, this school year. Um, some of the students in the cell phones, uh, as Ms. Rowe talked about, uh, they've been fighting in school since I was in school. Mm -hmm. Now the, the students are videotaping those incidents. And sometimes they post them instantly. 
But what we've also realized is that sometimes you see fights that happen in school and they happen years ago. So we also are managing that at the same time. So as our parents are seeing these fights and we're when we're going back and looking at them, those things happen in, in, in 2018. No, I, I, I don't want to. I appreciate your answer, but I'm trying to keep it short and keep yeah, my question gotcha. short. Yeah. So are you seeing an uptick in aggressive behaviors across the organization, across PCPS? Yeah. Yes, the answer is yes. We're, we're seeing a, we're seeing an uptick in aggressive behaviors. We're also seeing a, a uptick in mental health support that is needed by students as well. So we have to ensure that we look at both of those items. Some of our students are real. Uh, the pandemic did some damage to some students, and we have to provide the supports uh, that they need. And that's what we are working towards to ensure. So the, the wonderful thing that you all did as a board, you gave us, gave us access to more school counselors. We now have more PPWs. We're utilizing our school psychologists. The, the mental health needs that some of our students came back to school with it has significantly increased than things that we've ever dealt with in, in the past. And that's what's happening uh, right now. So we're all, all of the adults, uh, we have to adjust the way that we have been supporting school over the years to meet their current needs. Um, so, so that's how I, I would answer your question. That's what's happening uh, in our schools. Do we have an increase in, in fighting? Uh, we, we, we can't, we're saying, we, do we have fighting in our schools? The, the answer to that is yes. But now the fighting goes on videotape where it didn't, you know, 10 years ago when I was uh, in a school. We had fights at that time uh, as well. But the mental health, inc the increases in the students who need mental health, we know for sure that has significantly increased. And the demands on the adults in the schools has significantly increased right. to support those students. Thank you. And, and I'd like to just add something, if you don't mind, Ms., uh, Mr. Mustafer, and I will just share that. We have been seeing, um, in, in compared to last year, the number of aggressive behaviors we've seen are down. They're not down significantly. They're down 10 to 11 percent. Um, it's moving in the right direction. It's still concerning. It's still concerning because by aggressive behaviors, we mean the fights. We mean what we term physical assaults. And so it is concerning because it's, it's still too much. And so I, uh, on October 25th, Dr. Williams sent a letter to the community where he referenced that data. And I know for some, that data was not satisfying because just because you've had a 10 or 11 percent decrease does not mean that you don't have a significant number of fights. And so that is something that we're working on. And so to point to what uh, Mr. Mustafer was talking about, the mental health needs, we've correspondingly seen that rise as well. So we know that. But we do believe that what we put in place is moving in the right direction. And we do believe with the concerted attention of all of these people who are working on this, making sure that we are looking at the implementation, we are ensuring consistency, we're educating our parents, we're including our partners, and then as a collective, we're looking at that data and saying, mm, that's not working, we need to course correct, we make that change. So short answer to you, the behaviors are down from last year. Um, they are too high, and the aggressive behaviors are concerning. I hope that is Somewhat let, an let me add one more thing. I know it's getting late, Mr. Kuhn, but keep in mind our schools are a part of our community. And so the, the one thing I will say, we have been working with our county executive as we have our Baltimore County stat, and we look at data. We look at what's happening in a particular area, not only in the school, but also that community. And so that's that's one of the advantages that we have because we we know the school is just not an island to itself. And so that collaboration is a little bit bigger and it gets to those resources uh, for students, for families. It gets to what's what's lacking in this particular community in terms of food and access. It's all of those conversations. So we just don't do this by ourselves. When I talk about the partnership, it's great to have folks to come in, but we also go out to the folks in our community to say, what's really happening? Is there something happening in that community? So they answered the question, but I just could not let that go. That has been a great asset for us to collaborate 
with the folks in the in, in Baltimore County government when they're looking at their data as a county to really have those conversations and to strategize what we may do differently, what resources may we need. Those are our monthly or quarterly sessions, quarterly sessions yes. we have with what, what's called a BC stat. Thank you. I do have to add, if you've been in the schools, there's a positivity this school year that has been incredible. Every time we deal with a fight or a serious incident, it, it's a blow to that. But the students returning this year, it was truly special. And, and we, are, we are in a trajectory where things are improving. It's going to take time. The mental health issues are real. It, folks are saying it's going to be years before we get back to where we need to be. But I don't want that lost because I think it's incredibly important. The students, the, the return to school this year, the energy was incredibly positive. We're talking a lot about the extremes, the situations we don't want. We're not talking enough about the good things that are happening every single day. And I, I, I'm falling into that trap too. We've got to get back to what's good about our schools. Mike. Ms. Scott. <laughs> Thank you. Just one last question. Um, I didn't know if you all saw the equity uh, committee's report that came out. And it, it had the suspension rates in there, and it showed that black elementary students had like a suspension rate 1.9% higher than their peers. That gap increased to 10.8% and 6.9 percentage points in middle school and high school, respectively. And it was saying that the children who were most impacted were like African American, black, Hispanic, Latino, American Indian who make up like 54% of the of the um, county students. So my question is when these suspensions happen and considering that they're being felt or, or the number of students who are being impacted are um, from um, various indigenous minority or marginalized communities before, if, if, if we know this is a trend because we know this is what the data has shown us, before a suspension, especially like a long-term suspension happens, do those go like to Dr. Williams or to somebody in the administration to review before they're actually suspended? Thank you. So if it's a long-term suspension, um, if a student is suspended to the student conduct hearing officer, then yes, that goes, that's like a board suspension. So that's reviewed ahead of time. Um, but I want to go back to one of the things that Dr. Williams said. Part of the the SIT committee, SIT suspension committee's work is actually to look at disproportionality in, in student discipline. So that's part of our charge is to disrupt that, what you just said about our marginalized students being suspended more than um, their, their, um, their white peers, basically. So that's part of our work is to look at that as well and to, and it, and to disrupt it. So some of the things that we do is we have those conversations with administrators to say, okay, so let's look at your data. Um, we're seeing that you're suspending more black and brown students as opposed to your white students. Let's look at why you're suspending your students and what's happening and where it's happening and who's writing the referrals because we have to get underneath that to see if there is something behind that um, because you know all of us have bias. All of us have different values, but what we want to do is get behind that, get underneath that. What's causing that? Is there something happening in that classroom for those black and brown boys and, and it's not being addressed? So that's part of the work of the SIT committee as well. We have uh, Mr. Handy on our committee. We have Ms. Myers on our committee to, to kind of um, in special education to talk about because that's also special services is another group where we, we're seeing those suspensions. So we, we're having those conversations to figure out how to disrupt that. How can we work with our adults to disrupt that type of um, those suspensions? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. McMillian. 
Yeah, real quick, I want to make a comment before I have a couple questions, brief questions. In my 25 years in a high school, I wrote very f few referrals. So it, was, it wasn't because I was overlooking behavior. I was ever trying to expand my, what I call, bag of tricks, my student management skills. And it was all about the relationship. I had more issues with kids in the hallway than I did my classroom because I was building those relationships. And I was a whole lot better the last five years of my career at the high school than I was the first five years. And, but when, when I wrote something and I sent it to the office, I expected something done because I'd taken care of all these others. And, you know, when I need some help with something major, I, I, expect, I expect somebody to step up and help me. I'm curious about the st student safety assistance. Generally speaking, how many are in a middle school and how many are in a high school? So it's based on enrollment, and so the smaller schools would have two, and it goes up to five with our larger schools. And then in addition to the base allocation, where there were situations where additional support was needed, additional safety assistance had been provided there. Okay. This morning at approximately 930, I got a report uh, from a person in the building that said that the number of student safety assistance at uh, General John Stricker uh, drastically decreased in the last few days. Is there a possibility that several left just walked out for whatever reasons and those numbers are, no, down, are now down lower after they were, you know, increased to try to stabilize the behavior in the school? So Stricker was originally assigned, I believe, allocated two, and then that was increased to three. I believe they just brought on their third person. If a third person has come on, I think what you're referring to is some additional support that was provided to the school in the short term to help them address some of the issues in the school. That was not our student safety assistance. That was a different type of support that was brought in. So that support is no longer at Stricker. So that's probably what was referenced and what you heard. Okay, but they thank have you. Not very lost their student safety assistance. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other comments or questions, board members? No? No? <laughs> well, thank you all very much. Outstanding presentation. Thank really you. appreciate it. Thank you all. Thank you all. The next item on the agenda is information items, which include the financial report for the period ending September 2022 and the system improvement team's update. The next item on the agenda is board committee updates. We'll start with the audit committee. Mr. McMillian. Members of the board, the board's audit committee met on Tuesday, November 15, 2022. At that time, the committee accepted the audit office's FY 2022 records management audit report. The report recommended the immediate lifting of the 2018 records destruction ban. This recommendation is being forwarded to the full board for approval. I move that the board accept the recommendation of the audit committee and immediately lift the records destruction ban. No second is needed. Is there any discussion? Mrs. Causey, and then Mr. Kuhn. Mr. Kuhn. Thank you. Um, I, I, I kind of question, and, and maybe you can speak to it, uh, Mr. McMillian, but what, what are the main concerns and what does, what does the ban encompass? Is it that, that we're lifting? Are, are we keeping some of it in place, or is it all just lifted and, and we're moving to some other program or um, I, I want to know what it's replaced with, if anything. I'm curious if Ms. Barr is in attendance on this meeting. Is she? Ms. Barr? Okay, I'll take a stab at that. At the last Building and Contracts Committee, there was a, a contract for expanding the, the warehouse space. And if I'm not mistaken, it revolves around space for records. And it was, I don't remember the exact number, the exact price of it, but it seems like it's just ever accumulating boxes of whatever. And sometimes, in fact, the, the discussion came up in building contracts that uh, 
we were running out of space so much that a lot of the records were in the hallways and at schools and just tying up space there. So if it's a space issue, you know, that's one of the issues that, that's at stake. Okay, I was in that committee meeting, and I recall very specifically the discussion that 80% of the records that are in the warehouse would not be affected by lifting any ban. So we're talking about 20% of the records in the warehouse. So I guess my... I won't be supporting this, but I support the idea of us understanding it better and, and maybe share, you know, reviewing the report or having a full discussion uh, about this problem or perceived problem because I, I don't agree that it is a problem. Um, and that specific contract we talked about um, was for many, many different things to be stored there, not just records. So I think we need to be clear about what we're talking about. And I don't know, because that was just thrown out, but I don't know if there are other things that I'm not aware of that perhaps was in the audit report that led to this 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 uh, motion. So uh, um, that's why I was asking the question. Thank you. If I may add some additional information, Mr. Kuhn, that the ban requires us to keep everything. The team started with the law office and then we hired Mr. Agosto. We looked at a schedule of rotating things digitally and things that could be uh, discarded. The ban that was placed, I want to say January of 2019, prior to my arrival, uh, required many offices to just keep everything. And in keeping everything, that has caused this accumulation of documents. So it's not that tomorrow we're gonna just start getting rid of things. Every, every office has a schedule. Schools have a schedule in which things are categorized, things are held uh, for a certain period of time, things are placed, um, some can be box and some can be digitized um, and so it was interesting looking at that report from the internal audit right now uh, if i remember two years ago we presented to the board just what we were looking like in keeping everything and at some point the question is do we continue to do something that was done for a particular issue that happened in 2018 now that we have a schedule, it was approved by the Maryland Archivist. Um, it's been vetted through law. We have a schedule to then start back. If we need to um, uh, discard items, um, there's a proper way and a timely way of doing that. That's what the team, that's what you charged us to look at. We did that. We had internal audit to look at our process and looking at their report, they made the recommendation at some point, and I think it came up at the last meeting when we were looking at a contract. You know, my recommendation was to the board, we have put things in place uh, as a safeguard, but right now to have the ban, it literally means we're keeping everything, and there's some cases we just don't need to keep every little piece of paper. Right. So, I, I so, don't disagree. So with I wanted the to give you I'm right. sorry. I wanted to give you mm. the context that was explained and that what I've read and what I've so heard uh, from the internal audit that it was a legitimate I think it's a legitimate recommendation. Yeah, I, I don't have a problem with the recommendation. I think it's just lack of understanding of what the the change is going to necessitate and fully understanding the schedule. So at this moment, I'm, I'm not going to support the motion. I definitely could support it in the future. I'm not against getting rid of stuff we don't need. Trust me, I'm not. Um, but at this point, I think reviewing and understanding the schedule would be useful for the whole board. I don't know if everyone has done that. Thank you. Thank you. And I'd like to speak to this as well. Um, I would support clarifying the current motion or the current directive that's in place to, you know, support digitization digitizing what we can that's a tough thing to say and it's late um but to support digital copies of of whatever can be 
digitized. Mm -hmm. And as a stakeholder shared tonight, we should be preserving that history where it makes sense so that we don't necessarily need a hard copy that takes up space um, where we can preserve a digital copy of it. So if the current directive does not allow that, and, and I was part of the board that originally put this in place and said, hey, digital copy is fine. We don't need to incur the costs of the physical space to store these documents if we're storing them digitally. Um, and there was some arguing back and forth. It's like, no, you said physical. It has to be physical. No, that wasn't the intent. The intent was to preserve the content. Um, I'm all for digital. That that makes perfect sense. I would support that amendment to the direct to, to the directive that's in place. That's not what this motion does. I would offer an amendment to that, but. At this late of an hour, I won't be supporting this for that reason. However, I am. I would support um, again modifying it to allow the physical copies to be discarded if there is a digital um, equivalent equivalent stored. So, if I may, um, members of the board, this is Margaret Ann Howie. Yes, Ms. Howie. Uh, just to clarify, the uh, the ban that is in place applies not only to records, but to non-records. So if, for example, there is a document and a copy, both of those documents have to be maintained. It's not just the record itself. Your ban encompasses non-records. That's one um, point, one touch point. The other touch point is that there are approximately, if you go to our records management website, there are approximately 20 schedules, uh, records retention schedules that have been approved by the Maryland State Archivist. You now have your records management program in IT. So in terms of looking towards the future, as the Emerge report did, it is possible at some point in the future to digitize, but the Emerge report did note that there are still costs associated with the digitization of records and the storage of digital records. But at this point, um, in terms of responding to some of the questions about the current schedules, all of them are posted, all of them are on the website, uh, all of them have been approved. So every single record in the school system is on a schedule, but not Records cannot be disposed of under your ban, and non-records cannot be disposed of under your ban. So everything is being maintained. Mrs. Causey. Your microphone, please. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Mr. McMillian, for um, bringing up this issue. Um, I am not going to support this. Um, being on the board for seven and a half years, I have quite a bit of institutional knowledge. I find it, um, uh, <clears throat> I find it rushed to do it in this manner. Uh, it, in the audit report, it says that um, there is no mention of Policy 2380 and how that's being implemented. There's um, mentioned about the iMERGE report recommendations are not fully implemented. Um, so that is a concern. And if that is a holdback to retention and it's causing a log jam, then that's a budget issue that should be in the budget uh, coming up. Um, also, there is a, a Office of Internal Audit report um, that in fact, there were boxes that were missing of data that should have been in the warehouse, um, including some related to human, re human resource records. Um, so if we're still uh, saying that we have data loss from the ransomware attack, then why would we lift a destruction ban when what we need is what was said at the meeting, use the warehouse space to orderly manage the documents, scan if that's appropriate and fiscally uh, available, uh, or find out if there's some reports there that are lost that can be recovered and useful to the school system. Uh, the other issue is July of 2022, the records management was just transitioned to the Department of Information Te Technology out of the Office of Law. Uh, so that's a new thing. So why are we gonna burden them with a whole uh, 
new thing with a ban, and I did have up the exact wording of the board's directive, and it did not say Thank you. non-records. It just said records. Thank you. Ms. Jose. Thank you. And and I was on the board when this record ban was put into motion. Um, and thank you, Ms. Howell, for explaining it so succinctly and clearly. There seems to be a lack of understanding on uh, records management, so you just do a blanket. Information is not always wisdom or knowledge. And the audit committee is thoroughly bad at this. iMERGE does record retention and archive, uh, how to archive records for government agencies around the country. So to just fear and just put in a blanket ban and burden the system, bottleneck it is not recommended. And, um, you know, I mean, you've explained it multiple times, as has the chief auditor and the external report um, that came through. But if you lack understanding or you don't want to, is this cognitive dissonance and you don't want to understand or you, you fail to understand, you, you don't want to understand, there's nothing we can do. Uh, but just, you know, move forward with what's, what we've got. So um, thank you again. And, um, you know, I, I support this. The committee unanimously approved it, all four members. Um, so that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. I had a question. Thank you, Ms. Scott. I'm, I acknowledge your question in the chat. Has anyone else who has not had a chance to speak on this motion? I have not had a chance to speak. Go ahead, Ms. Scott. Thank you. Sorry, I said that because I couldn't tell if you saw my question or not. Um, my question or my statement is, um, again, uh, for clarification, I remember when this contract came up, we did talk about it, and it was the million. It was a, an addition, a million dollars in storage because of this record ban. It was causing us to have to purchase more storage. We needed to purchase more storage, anyways. But because of this, we we were having to purchase a million dollars worth of storage. That's what I remembered from the last conversation. Um, and I had asked about it being put like in a cloud or, or, or some other format. Um, I guess the way I look at it is, is um, the chair of the audit committee has made this recommendation. The audit committee has reviewed this and looked at it. And I think that um, we should accept the um, motion and take their recommendation and, and move forward and not be stuck in the past. Thank you. Thank you. So there's a motion. There was no second needed as the recommendation came from the committee. Ms. Gover, may I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rao? Pass. Ms. Causey? No. Ms. Jalewski? Yes. Ms. Jose? Can you come back to me, Ms. Gover? Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? No. Ms. Hen? No. Ms. Rao? No. Ms. Jose? No. Favor is five. So the motion fails. The next committee update is the budget committee. Mr. Kuhn. Thank you, Ms. Hen. On November the 16th, we held the last budget committee meeting. Um, the information that I'd like to share uh, is available uh, on board docs. Uh, it has the FY 2020 and the FY 2021 Every Student Succeeds Act uh, data broken down by school per pupil that shows the funding of every school across this entire organization for 20 and 21. There's been a lot of discussion about resourcing and lack of resourcing in schools. Uh, so I. The purpose of putting it here uh, was to make this data available to people, to the public, to everyone on this board. Um, it also has per pupil uh, 
uh, as an informational item, the FY22 per pupil and Title I budget allocations by school. So all of this information is publicly available, and I would suggest anyone with any interest to understand how our schools are resourced to review this data. Uh, I've been trying to get to it for a long time, and, um, uh, and Mr. Tantliff and Mr. Hartlove have done a, f a good job, and this is actually now compiled by law uh, and needs to be presented and provided to the public in this format. So um, it's great information. Please take a look. Thank you. Thank you. Building and contracts, Ms. Joes. Thank you. The next Building and Contracts Committee uh, meeting will be held December 6th, Monday at 5 p.m. Thank you. Curriculum Committee, Ms. Doluski for Mr. Offerman. I don't have a written, he, no didn't, update? he didn't give me an update. Okay, no worries. So I don't have, I can look up the next meeting if you want me to look it up. Sure, I can come back to you. Um, Equity Committee, Ms. Scott. There we go. Thank you. So we had the equity committee meeting. It was November 17th, and we discussed system improvement teams, review of recruiting and retention of a highly qualified, diverse workforce. And we went over the staffing and summer recruitment, and we talked about um, how they were um, the system was able to meet the teacher workforce diversity goal as originally planned in the compass. We revisited and revised the HBCU recruitment plan. We heard about that and um, we learned about uh, feedback from different schools, how different job fairs went and also partnerships with local colleges, universities to host student interns. And we also um, discussed with local, um, we talked about how out um, human resources connected with local HBCUs to initiate discussions on building or expanding partnership schools and formally identified Rossville Elementary as a partner school with Morgan State University. So these are some of the ways that um, BCPS is growing and working together. And our next meeting for the equity committee will be Thursday, January 19th at 4 p.m. And the ec next equity committee with the council will be January 5th at 5.30 p.m. Thank you. Thank you. Policy Review Committee, Ms. Rowe. Yes, the Policy Review Committee met on um, November 14th. And the next Policy Review Committee is um, not until March. So... There's some time between that. Um, I think, Tracy, is that wrong? Is it February? It's some significant period of time from now, and I think that just will allow the new board to sit and assign committee chairs and whatnot. So um, we've reviewed a lot of policies, and we've moved them through um, the board and have caught up on a, a lot of work. There's still a lot more to go, so... That work continues. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Tulowski, were you able to find the um, So I do have one update from the curriculum. We did have a wonderful presentation on the proposed reading curriculum, which I would encourage everybody to look at on board docs, especially if you're going to be involved in the vote that will come. Um, it was an exceptional and very clarifying presentation. I do not have the date on my calendar. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to all of our committee chairs for all of your hard work this year. I truly do appreciate it. Um, uh, if you're watching, most a lot of our work does get um, done in committee, so would encourage you to check out those meetings and, and the hard work of these groups. They really do contribute a lot, and um, through both preparation and work in the meetings themselves and some amazing discussions and work with staff and thank you um, to our staff, to our staff liaisons that support the work of these committees. Um, so I really appreciate everyone's support with your committees. Thank you very much. Thank you to Julia and Rod too. Oh, thank you. With that, the last item on the agenda is announcements. The board's next meeting will be held on Tuesday, December 6th, 2022 at 6.30 p.m. Thank you all very much for joining us tonight. Have a warm and wonderful Thanksgiving. 
the meeting. Some of you, your last is now adjourned. Congratulations.